The bell tolls 6 o'clock p.m. This meeting of your Pontiac City Council is hereby called to order for March 1st, 2022. Uh, we have uh, our special guest this evening for our invocation. I'd like to give the floor to the Honorable Council and Kathleen James to introduce our guest. Good evening. Tonight we will have the invocation given by uh, Pastor Phil Hutchins who is the pastor of, uh, <laughs> oh my gosh, I'll, I'll let him introduce uh, his congregation, but uh, Pastor Hutchins is a phenomenal pastor and teacher in the Pontiac community. He is a part, his congregation is located in District 4, and we are very, very happy to have him here tonight as our, uh, to, to give the invocation for the 11th Council meeting. Pastor Hutchins. Pastor teacher in the Pontiac community. He is a part, his congregation is located in District 4. I'm going to ask everyone if you would at this time. I'm Pastor Philip Hutchins of Last Days Ministries, Church of God in Christ here in the city of Pontiac, but it's not about me. It's about Jesus Christ and his kingdom, and I just come to help you all lift up his name as you go into your meeting on tonight. I'm going to ask everyone if you will bow your heads at this time. Father God in heaven is once again that we come before your throne of grace. Dear Lord, we come humbly, we have boldly, we thank you, we praise, we glorify, we magnify you, we lift you up. Satan, the Lord, rebuke you. The blood of Jesus come against you. We bind and we cast you out now, through and by God's blood, through and by the anointing of the Holy Ghost. God, I ask that you would step into this meeting. Have your way on tonight. God, let peace ascend in the room and amongst the people that are sitting here, that they may Go forth with the business for this city. Do it now in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you and we praise you. We glorify, we magnify you. Touch each one that sit as the council of the city of Pontiac. Do it now in the name of Jesus. And God, before I end this prayer, God, I pray for Russia and Ukraine on tonight. I ask that you would go over there and I ask that you would step in. Step out of glory into the midst of them. Speak a word of peace. Do it now. Bind up everything that is not like you. In the name of Jesus, God, I thank you. God, I praise you. God, I glorify you. I magnify and I lift you up now. You're able to do anything but fail. These are not the blessings we pray and we ask. In Jesus' name, thank God. Amen and amen. Amen. Please rise now for the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a moment of silence. We'll read names that our community has lost. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing. Uh, in recent days, our community has lost Stanley Manns Sr., Linda Green, Floyd Jug Radcliffe III, Paul Woods Jr., William Punkin Smith, Edward Hilly, Christopher Harris, Annie Denard, Mary Foster, Maria Gonzalez, and Martha Ramey. And echoing the words of uh, Pastor Hutchins, let's also in this moment of silence remember those who've lost their lives uh, in Ukraine uh, with this Russian aggression. Moment of silence, please. Thank you. Roll call, roll call Clerk Doyle. Sherrington. Present. Goodman. Present. James. Here. McGinnis. Present. Nicholson. Here. Parker. Here. Rutherford. Present. Mr. President, you have a quorum. Thank you. Quorum being established and all members uh, present and voting. Uh, is there a motion to approve this evening's agenda? I no move. Motion. Support. It's been moved by Councilman Parker, seconded by Councilman Rutherford. Uh, now that that uh, main motion is before us, is there a motion to amend the agenda to add a new discussion item? after agenda address, but before the first resolutions uh, for a forensic audit, firm selection, 
update. So move Nicholson. Report. It's been moved by Councilman Nicholson, seconded by Councilman Rutherford, that we amend this evening's agenda to add that discussion item. Any discussion on that? Hearing no discussion, roll call on that amendment to add the discussion item. Clerk Doyle. James? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Nicholson? Yes. Parker? Yes. Rutherford? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Goodman? Yes. Seven yeas, no nays. That motion carries. We're now at the main motion. Are there any more uh, amendments, corrections, questions, clarifications on this evening's agenda as amended? Hearing no further uh, discussion, speakers list exhausted. Roll call on the main motion, uh, adoption of the agenda as amended. Clerk Doyle. Goodman? Yes. James? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Nicholson? Yes. Parker? Yes. Rutherford? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Seven yeas, no nays. That motion carries. Uh, we do have a very uh, substantial uh, agenda this evening, and to respect your time, uh, we will try and be as efficient as possible. So I'll call upon my colleagues that uh, if it's a matter that we've already thoroughly pursued, uh, that will be expeditious in carrying out uh, towards a vote uh, where applicable. Uh, so I just wanted to share that, and, and I'll work hard to facilitate that accordingly. Uh, is there a motion to approve this evening's consent agenda? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Councilman Rutherford, seconded by Councilman Goodman. Uh, not a debatable motion, but for the community's benefit, it's the minutes from the February 22nd City Council meeting and then the February 10th Finance and Personnel Subcommittee meeting minutes. Uh, on approval of the consent agenda, roll call, Clerk Doyle. McGinnis? Yes. Nicholson? Yes. Parker? Yes. Rutherford? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Goodman? Yes. James? Yes. That motion carries. We're now at special presentations. And the first is the drinking water asset management grant that the city of Pontiac has been awarded. And uh, presenting this evening is one of our Oakland countywide elected officials, the Oakland County Water Resources Commissioner, Jim Nash, and his team, as well as Alexander Borngesser, the city's grants manager. Commissioner Nash, you have the floor. Thank you, sir. I appreciate being here. It's good to be the, in front of the new county city council uh, for the first time. So, um, as always, we're here to serve you guys the best we can. Um, this is we're going to be talking about a grant tonight that um, we got recently that we're going to be using to the benefit of the city. I'm not the expert at this. This is uh, Amy Pluff. She does my uh, water systems uh, in charge of uh, most of those, especially for the city of Pontiac. So, Amy's going to let take care of this. Hi there, I'm Amy Ploof. I'm the Chief Engineer for Drinking Water for the Oakland County Water Resource Commissioner's Office. So as Mr. Nash said, we're here to share good news. Uh, the City of Pontiac's Drinking Water System has been awarded a grant from the State of Michigan for $456,000. We're going to use those funds to do required compliance work in the water system to um, maintain compliance with the lead and copper rule. In the updated lead and copper rule, drinking water systems are required to do a verified field services inventory of service lines. So what's required with there is uh, we'll be sending out letters to 377 homes within the city. Um, we'll ask that those folks who get the letter to give us a call. What will happen was someone will come to your home, they'll verify the service line material entering your home, and then we'll provide educational materials to the, that customer. Um, so the whole process should take less than half an hour, but we really do appreciate um, folks that are able to help us out with this project. Um, I also wanted to give you an update on our drinking water sampling. Um, the sampling continues to show very low lead levels. So um, our most recent sampling was completed and the results range from below detection to three parts per billion. The action level for lead is 15 parts per billion. So we're well below any level of concern. Uh, there's also a very small portion of the grant that we're going to use for overall planning in the system, and we'll use those funds to help um, improve our decision making when we go forward with water mains and service line replacements. So um, we're very happy to be here today, and we look forward to continuing to work with you. Any questions uh, for our presenters? Mayor Grimal, then Councilman James. Well, first of all, Commissioner Nash, uh, thank you for your service. And of course, we've known each other a long time, going back to our days on the on the county commission uh, together 15 years ago, and about long time 17 now. maybe years ago now. Uh, but uh, so, thank you for for your work. I appreciate uh, our staff person, Alex Borengesser, and her involvement in the in the grant process as well. So, really appreciate 
uh, all of your dedication to the community and your successfully obtaining uh, this grant to benefit the community. Uh, very happy to hear, of course, that the parts per uh, billion, uh, I think with a B, parts per billion of lead is uh, three, whereas the actionable level is 15. So we're uh, at 20% of the actionable level, which is well below uh, the concern uh, level, which is uh, encouraging news. Uh, but I do know that we have some lead service lines here in the city and wanted to uh, get a sense uh, from you about uh, the schedule for replacing those lead service lines. I assume that we should still, as a matter of best, best practice, replace those lead service lines, even though our lead level is well below an actionable level. So I just wondered if you might uh, be able to comment on that. Sure. Um, yeah, we're, we're in this process. We're, we're doing really two sets of things. There's some that we're when, when we're replacing mains, we're doing all the ones that are having to do with those replacements. We're also planning out how we're going to do the ones that are not new, uh, that are newer mains, so we're not going to be replacing many times soon. So um, there's two sides that we're doing that. And beyond that, I'm going to let her take care of it because, once again, she's in charge of that. So, <laughs> no, Mr. Mr. Dash described that perfectly. Um, the areas with old water mains, there's about 300 miles of water main in the city, and about half of that is um, nearing the end of its useful life. So that those water mains that are old are most, most likely to have lead service lines. So as Mr. Nash mentioned, when we go in and replace the water mains in those areas, we'll be replacing the service lines. So that way there's less disruption to customers. It's a better overall level of service. Um, there are some in other areas, you know, that we're going to pick up as we go along. Um, it won't, you know, so there'll be more individual e efforts. Um, so what we ask is when, when we come to your home and we knock on the door, we have to come in and um, verify the line coming into the home. So if folks could just uh, cooperate with our teams that go out there to those addresses, we would really appreciate that. Mayor Brown. What material is now used for either water mains and or service lines? Uh, obviously, lead is bad. We all know that, and I think have known that for many decades now. Uh, but what what is the material of choice nowadays? We're using copper service lines, and then a water main is either ductile iron or HDPE, high-density polyethylene. So it's a, it's a plastic-like material. Councilman James. Yes, uh, my question is, uh, will you give the council uh, information about when you know your schedule of the areas that you're going into to do this uh, assessment so that we can give our residents a heads up? Yes, uh, the, the way the, the state required the rules here is we have to do 377 verifications at random addresses. So oh. once we generate the list of random addresses, we'll share that with you. But that's uh, that's the rules from the state, so we must follow them. So they have to be random. Yeah, they have to. And I think the idea is a statistical analysis. So you're saying, you know, we don't have to check every service line. If you check this portion of them that are randomly generated, mm -hmm. and then you can verify against your initial inference. That will help you have a better confidence level in their data that we have. Okay. Others that wish to have the floor? Councilman Nicholson. Will there be additional opportunities for more lines after these 377? Is there another phase or more or future opportunities? Yes, uh, we're always verifying materials whenever we go in a home when we do a meter replacement or we'll do um, service line work or there's a main break, something like that. We, we, we add the uh, service line material to our records and that helps us better um, infer other materials where we don't have an exact record for that. So yep, there, there'll be more, there's kind of ongoing, it's, this is just kind of a real targeted effort to meet that compliance rule. Thank you. Those who wish to the floor. In conclusion, since we have you here, I do want to uh, celebrate the Oakland County Water Resources Commission staff. Uh, Councilwoman James and I were recently on a call with a number of members of your team and the receptivity and proactiveness that your team has mm -hmm. for green uh, improvements, green infrastructure that could be done for stormwater uh, retention and, and just uh, aesthetic enhancements to our neighborhoods where it's strategic when we're in the future uh, making improvements to our public spaces, our parks, our green spaces. So I just want to thank uh, your department, your office for that. And I know Councilman Nicholson uh, has been able to call on you frequently uh, when there's been issues with the uh, road construction, road repair, and as it relates to main improvements 
Don't know if right. you want to elaborate on that further, Councilman Nicholson. Yeah, no, it's it's been great. Whenever there's a, a truck sitting around on a street, I call, and right away I get a call back, and they tell me exactly what's going on and the estimate and whether there's going to be a boil advisory or not. And, um, of course, they've been quick to get out to the homes when there has been to let them know about those advisories. And I know even in the depths of this winter and the coldest time, especially up on Baldwin, we had a horrible water main uh, break, and it was just the coldest, most snowy, most the worst day possible, and your team was out there getting to work so oh, it's, absolutely. it's recognized and appreciated my my field folks are out there you know from the 90 degree heat to 30 below zero a couple of years ago we had main breaks all through town because of that 30 below zero weather and mm -hmm. my folks were out there doing that and this is the woman that's in charge of all those folks and i can tell you one thing to the other we're always busy and um and and uh Councilman McGinnis, when, when, we're, when we're working on these things, on the, on the long-term viability of our stormwater, which climate change is the biggest, important, most important part of that because it's only going to be getting more intense storms over time. So we have to deal with that. Green infrastructure, all the things we're doing about improving the infrastructure in the community that you have. When we came into office, uh, over 70% of the uh, infrastructure underground was either uh, between 80 and 120 years old well past this useful lifetime. Mm -hmm. So this is what we're doing. We're making this system going uh, to be to last for, for many, many decades. What we're replacing things with are much more stable, much more uh, engineered than they were 100 years ago. So when we're putting them in the ground, they should last even longer. And this is what we're going to be leaving when we, when we leave this system. Uh, we, we want it to be the best it can ever be. And um, that's what we're working to do. Mayor Grinnell. One more question, and sorry to keep you, Commissioner, but um, you mentioned severe weather events, and of course we're seeing more of those due to climate change, uh, and you mentioned the, the higher quality of the materials and, and the, the materials being more stable and longer lasting, which is great news. I, I do wonder, in terms of the more severe weather events, are we building the infrastructure now to allow for greater capacity uh, during severe weather events so as to hopefully alleviate uh, backups into people's basements and and other uh, implications from severe weather events as those you know those once in a hundred year storms are presumably going to be happening much more frequently than that and my hope is that we're building infrastructure that will uh, better um, avoid uh, the implications like backups in basements as a result of those severe weather events as they happen with greater frequency. Oh, I absolutely I understand. Um, th it's the, it's the, the dis uh, decision on where to go, whether it's gray infrastructure, you know, the, the big tanks and pumps and pipes, or the green infrastructure, which is more limiting what gets into that system. We're working on both. We really have to have make sure we have the capacity to deal with the storms that come. We also are, are trying to develop green infrastructure, um, diversion of flow away from the, the, well, the direct uh, impact on the storm drains. The more we can, we can uh, get in the way of uh, a roof, a parking lot, and that storm drain, the more we can infiltrate in the ground before it gets into that storm drain. So we're looking at both. We need to make sure that we have the capacity to, to do those things. Uh, the gray infrastructure is far more expensive to put in. Um, the, the electricity, the, the, the energy that it takes to run them can add up significantly because it's ad infinitum. You're, you're, as long as you have it, you've got you to gotta power it. Um, and, and then eventually it has to be re, uh, maintained and replaced. So all those things, if we can do things on the surface to make it infiltrate more, that's going to be the, the long-term help get that edge off those big, big storms. Um, but we do need to work on both, and that's what we're doing. Again, in, in every city that we operate and maintain, um, plus we, we advise on a lot of other communities regionally. So um, we work with the Great Lakes Water Authority, with SEMCOG, with all the groups that are doing that. Um, right now we have a significant uh, influx of funding from the federal government. Um, we're looking to, to spend that in the most efficient, long-term way we can. Um, and that, a lot of that involves regional collaboration, regional cooperation. So cities working with the surrounding cities can do a lot more with that money if they can use their own, leverage others, and then work as a region. Well, thank you very much for being with us tonight. This was 450. Oh, did I cut you off? Well, I did have one question. Um, Perfect. And to make it really short, um, can you briefly explain the difference between green and gray infrastructure so people know the, the line? 
green inf gray infrastructure is things like um, you know again the, the pipes the pumps the big tanks underground um, that that deal with the water when it hits it um, gray in green infrastructure is more around um, finding ways of like rain barrels on roofs you've seen them um, rain gardens along uh, um, for residents or in businesses uh, they're called uh, there's things called um, uh, uh, um, oh my gosh in parking lots they're uh, Swales, bioswales, she's so handy, um, <clears throat> or bioswales, where the water comes off the parking lot into a ditch where it can go down into the ground instead of immediately right to the next storm drain. Mm -hmm. So when we do those kind of things, we limit what's getting into that system. That's going to help us tremendously in the long term. So if anything that, that mimics how nature absorbs water instead of concrete and mm -hmm. roofs and things like that, that's the green infrastructure. You can do it in your own home. Plus, a rain garden is beautiful. You can grow natural flowers that grow here naturally. Deep roots really helps with drainage. Thank you. President Pro Tem Carrington. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, President Again, Just one quick uh, question. Um, last year, uh, during the time Consumer Energy came through and started working on the lines in different neighborhoods across the city, uh, once they was breaking up that ground, it would seem to be like a lot of flooding, uh, especially in the Knoll subdivision. Um, and I'm kind of wondering, is, is that due to uh, the drains being just overflowed with dirt and, and, uh, d and debris along that area? Yeah, I, I couldn't hazard a guess. Let me get hold of, get hold of me. Um, I would be happy to investigate for you, make sure what we can find out, if there's anything that, that again, if they're, they're like pulverizing something on the ground, it can have an impact down below. So we'd be happy to check into anything like that, that, can, uh, that if, if you have a question. All right, thank you. Thank you. And so this was a $456,000 uh, grant. And just finally, how many hundreds of miles in the city of Pontiac do we have underground? You have 300 miles of water main. Mm -hmm. Wow. But we're not there yet. <laughs> uh, thank you very much uh, for your presentation and your time this evening. Our next special presentation, we have Oakland County Commissioner Angela Powell uh, presenting some awards this evening. Commissioner Powell. Good evening, Council and the Mayor. How are you all today? Um, I also actually, in, in, in addition to my presentation, remember when I came earlier this year and I said I had some little trinkets and stuff that I was going to bring you all? My assistant, Sylvia Campbell, is going to distribute a bag. And in this bag, it has trinkets from different Oakland County departments. It has the Oakland County Directory, which is from 2020, but the 2022 one, we probably will have a new one after this election. I don't, I can't remember the years. COVID kind of threw it off as to how often she does it, but I brought the latest one we have. So you all have a, a um, directory from the county, Oakland County Water Resource uh, Department calendar, where they display kids' art from the students' um throughout the schools in Oakland County. So I gave a, co a copy of that. Our Oakland County blueprint for our seniors. And um, with the calendar though, one thing I wanted to stress, I didn't see, in, you could just give one to each one or they could pass it down if y'all don't mind. Um, you can grab a couple of them. This don't, just, come on, not one by one. Sorry, I, I'm just trying to assist her, sorry. Um, um, for the calendar, I want to bring to your attention that when you get a chance, if you have a, a, a student that is interested or with the school district, if we can kind of get that, I would love to see our students participate in it. I didn't touch with the WRC department to see what process is, but none of our City of Pontiac kids were displayed in it. But I wanted to share the art and keep it on your radar as something to kind of display youth from your districts in that calendar. Mm -hmm. So that's that. Um, another thing, I had a couple announcements. I'm sorry, I know it was just two presentations, but it's very important stuff going on at the county that I really want you all to know about. Um, I have a flyer here that I'll leave here in regards to veterans assistance so that you can give this out and distribute to your um, constituents as far as veteran services that we have at the county. Also, summer jobs for ages 16 and up. I have a flyer that I will leave here for you all as well to distribute and take, and it just display all the summer jobs and different jobs we have at the county for you all. And I also want to bring to your attention, I had a great meeting this morning with some partners in our city who are coming together and whose leading initiative is the Pontiac Collaborative Coalition Group. 
um, in regards to jobs. They're taking the initiative to be kind of the spearhead and keeping all of us organizations together to make sure that our youth and adults know about all the jobs going that are available. Because right now at Michigan Works, right now, you all, we have anywhere between 20 and 30 million of job funding, training, different careers. You name it, it's probably there. But the issue is our constituents are not going to Michigan Works. So I'm here to set stress. Michigan Works, please call. If you're looking for a job for your kids, you 16 and up, and if you're an adult, 18 to 24 or over 24, looking for a career change, please patronize our Michigan Works department. I mean, our Michigan Works location, which is on the corner of Walton and Perry. Sorry, I do not have a phone number, but if you Google Michigan Works Pontiac, I know it will come up and utilize that uh, division um, for some assistance and looking for a job. And then recently, um, at 148 North Saginaw Street, Pontiac, Michigan, 48342, we have a harm reduction and syringe service location. I brought flyers. I did get an email in regards to a constituent kind of concerned about this, but I think it's a good thing. Um, and I see my... Uh, uh, Brett Nicholson, yeah, which is in District One. It's amazing. They're um, they're doing full inoculations. It's it's a full extension of the health department. So they're, thank it's you. A really great resource we have. So it sits in District One, but District Two business. He's a business owner. It's down the street from this location, and it has a slew of services. So I'll leave this with your com your council people. You can reach out to them in the mayor's office, so they have this as well. So it's to uh, reduce, yeah, different things. So. Um, I'm not going to go into detail, but this is a flyer also. Now, I'll move to the special presentation. So, this year, out at Oakland County, um, commissioners, we have a tendency to pass a lot of resolutions and not put action to them. So, my colleague, Yolanda Charles, charged us when she became a commissioner and said, hey, why don't we every month, if it's some type of Black History Month, Women's Month, let's start doing something, recognizing constituents in our districts, whatever. So I ran with the idea. So last month, and I know we a day away from Black History Month, um, and because I didn't have any, we don't have any additional meetings for February, I asked our wonderful president, uh, council president if I could present to two individuals who were nominated because this was the first year also that we created a award called Black Excellence Award, where we honored um, individuals throughout Oakland County, and you have to be nominated by somebody. It could be by anybody. Now, for us with the city of Pontiac, we, it, can't, it narrowed down to three. One individual lived in uh, Commerce. For Pontiac, it was Richard Bell. A lot of you all know him. He does a lot with the STEM, with the youth and the kids. And then we had another individual from Southfield. Well, Pontiac had got a, a couple other individuals, and I felt like even though the Black Excellence Award is a great thing, I felt like I wanted to honor them more with a proclamation from the county to, de to, to describe and discuss more of what they did. So I asked the council president. He's allowing me the time. And the two individuals that I'm honoring today is Esmo Woods and Quincy Stewart. Okay. And Quincy Stewart didn't even know. So you both, both of these individuals were nominated by individuals, I thank you, but I took them out because I wanted to recognize them in a more respectful and iconic way because they have both and still, well, Esmo Woods is retired, but we know, we all know in this room, Quincy Stewart is, is still involved in our community doing great things. So first I will start with Esmo Woods. And I do know one of his family members were supposed to be, oh, hi, hi. So, um, well, you can sit for now. All right, so let's talk about Mr. Esmo Woods. Um, Oakland County Board of Commissioners proclamation honoring Esmo T. Woods. Whereas those special individuals that go over and beyond to honor and contribute to their communities are sure to leave a lasting positive impact on those communities as well as on the lives of others. And whereas Esmo T. Woods is one such individual, his parents, Joseph and Mary, came to Michigan in 1914 and moved to Pontiac in 1922. Mr. Woods is the author of Pontiac, The Making of a U.S. Capital, 1818, 
1950, which was published in 1991 and is the first comprehensive history of the city of Pontiac. He also published six books as CEO of Mary Hannah Woods Publishing and whereas Mr. Woods taught high school for Chicago Public Schools from 1958 to 1965. He went on to serve as a compliance officer with the Department of Housing and Urban Development Civil Rights Division in Chicago, Illinois from 1965 to 1969 and as Assistant Dean of Urban Affairs at Oakland University from 1969 to 1971. Mr. Woods retired from his role as a hospital administrator from Pontiac General Hospital in 1995 after 20 years of service. And whereas Mr. Woods graduated from Pontiac Central High in 1951, I mean Central, you know, y'all always rah rah, and I thought they were gonna rah rah. I'm a northern baby, sorry, but I let Central get there. Order in the chamber, <laughs> order chiefs and husbands. Um, he was the first African American to be class president and second African American all state basketball player. He earned a bachelor's in arts from Fisk University in 1995 and a master of arts in history and political science from Columbia University in 1958, where he interviewed W.E.B. Du Bois for his master research project. And whereas Mr. Woods is a former member of the board of directors for the Boys and Girls Club of Pontiac and the Pontiac Visiting Nurses Association, he has won numerous awards, including the 1998 Fisk University Outstanding Alumni Award, 1992 Man of the Year Awards from the Zeta Phi Beta and the Negro Business Professional Organization, and was recognized by the state Michigan House of Representatives, and whereas today we join with friends and family of Mr. Woods, as well as entire Pontiac community, um, to honor and thank him for his accomplishments and contributions to the city of Pontiac. Now, therefore, Dave T. Woodward and myself do hereby proclaim special condemnation to Esmo T. Woods a test on his first day of March 2022 in Pontiac, Michigan. And this is, you are his nephew. Oh, this is Mr. Darren Woods, who's Mr. Woods' nephew, to pick up the proclamation on his behalf. Thank you. And Mr. Woods, this city council also unanimously adopted a resolution acknowledging Mr. Esmo Woods as a citizen of great distinction uh, in February as well. So I, I was in touch with Wendell Woods, uh, but on behalf of the entire city of Pontiac and the city council, we echo Commissioner Powell's uh, celebration of Mr. Woods. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. And now, and then I'll be out of your hair and out your way. Now we have the Oakland County Board of Commissioners proclamation honoring Quincy Stewart. Whereas those special individuals that go over and beyond to educate the young people in the communities are sure to leave a lasting positive impact on those communities as well as on the lives of others. And whereas Quincy Stewart is one such special individual, he is an outstanding musician and educator who is devoted to providing his students with high level, high quality instruction and in his own words, a truthful education. Mr. Stewart is committed to incorporating social justice themes into his engaging lessons. Beyond teaching them to play instruments, he challenges his students to excel and to learn how to overcome obstacles and adversity. And whereas Mr. Stewart is a former band director for the Pioneer School District and served in the same role at the Pioneer Academy for Excellence from 2002 to 2008, he is currently band director for the Education Achievement Authority of Michigan and the Detroit Community School District. And whereas in addition to, be, to being a musician and educator, Mr. Stewart is always an activist. He regularly, <laughs> regularly attends Pontiac City Council meetings to share his thoughts during open forum. Mr. Stewart is committed to exercising his constitutional rights and making his voice heard. 
And we're as today we join with friends and family of Mr. Stewart as well as the entire Pontiac community to honor and thank him for his, accompl his accomplishments and contributions to the city of Pontiac. Now, therefore, David T. Woodward, Chairman on the Oakland County Board of Commissioners, and myself do hereby proclaim special condemnation to Quincy Stewart attest on this first day of March 2020 in Pontiac, Michigan. Come up, Mr. Stewart. say really quickly I I absolutely don't deserve to be even mentioned in the same breath as Asmo Woods. And I, if, if I could ever get to where your is it your uncle? If I could ever get to that place, then I'll feel like I deserve this. Well I'm just happy I can make some constituents here in our city happy today and thanks for the time and enjoy you all's gift from the county. Thank you. Thank you. Without objection I'll uh, Segue right now to our next and final special presentation, the Oakland County Sheriff PAL program offerings and updates from Executive Director Lauren Fuller. You have the floor. Hi, everyone. Uh, happy Tuesday. Happy March. Um, congratulations to all of you on your appointments, and um, thank you for your commitment to the community. And thank you for all of you for attending as well. Uh, I have the distinct privilege of representing Oakland County Sheriff Police Athletic League. Uh, we've been serving in this community primarily since 2015, impacting upwards of 4,000 youth through sports and recreation. Our mantra is really simple. Uh, we want to build character through sports and recreation and make um, high quality opportunities for kids to interact, play, learn new skills, and engage in healthy habits, uh, free and accessible across Oakland County, um, with Pontiac being a priority service area for us. I just want to make everyone aware, I do have some flyers, and I believe all of the council has uh, the Spring One flyer as well, um, that we do have uh, extensive programs that are available all year round. Uh, right now we're finishing up our winter one session in the winter two session. Uh, spring one begins at the end of March. Um, our programs are all free and open to anyone in the community. There are no residency restrictions. There's no income restrictions. Uh, there are maybe some age priorities. Uh, most of our programs are geared at elementary and middle school aged uh, children. We are lucky enough to operate in several shared spaces from Woodside Bible Church, Welcome Missionary Baptist, the Salvation Army, and United Wholesale Mortgage Sports Complex um, allow us to host our programming and keep our infrastructure and costs very low so that we're able to accommodate and expand our services. Uh, through a partnership with the city, we were able to launch a Pontiac Youth Basketball League, which just finished up this past Saturday. Welcoming over 10 teams from the community and surrounding areas to um, play basketball. It was super, super awesome. Uh, we recognize that relationships are what really drives our programming, and sports are simply the vehicle to build um, empowered youth and thriving communities and really take um, great priority in ensuring that we're able to do that. We also, in everything that we do, want to ensure that quality is at the top of mind and that um, a program, whether it is free or cost, uh, shouldn't impact the program quality. Uh, we also take great pride in a majority of our coaching staff are from the community of Pontiac. They uh, grew up here, they played sports here, they have families here and are deeply committed to the success of our young people, uh, families, and the community at large. Um, so just to make everyone aware, again, our programs are free, they are open to everyone. Uh, we work on really collaborating, whether it's with the, the city, area churches, uh, recreation programs, the um, Friends of Pontiac Parks to make our spaces and programs uh, at a wide variety of locations. Um, if any council people, if you are interested in seeing more programmings, uh, programs within your district, uh, we're a nimble organization and very interested in how we can make that happen. Uh, we can run all the amazing programs that we want, but unless we're serving the youth that are within our mission, you know, our, our mission itself ceases to exist. So we're very, very open and wanting to ensure that we can provide programming wherever there are youth that need it. We don't need a whole lot other than some space, some grass, a basketball court, uh, whatever it is, and we can bring along 
uh, the amazing uh, people, the marketing, the partnerships, and uh, combined resources to make some of these things happen. I will leave some additional spring one flyers. We'll be operating spring one and then um, some different teams and leagues throughout the spring and summer as well. Um, share with your any kids in your neighborhood, your, um, your districts, uh, anyone in the surrounding areas. Again, free and open to anyone. Thank you. Any questions for the presenter? I got a calf spasm here trying to stay on my tiptoe. I guess if I could bring this down a little bit. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time tonight and uh, for your partnership with the city of Pontiac and our residents. Yeah, absolutely. Hearing no requests uh, for a question, uh, that concludes a special presentation. Are there any elected officials with us this evening seeking to be recognized? Seeing none, we are now at agenda address. President Pro Tem Carrington, you have the floor. Uh, President McGinnis, we have. That will be after agenda address, but before the first agenda item. Uh, we have no one that wants to um, address the council concerning the agenda tonight. All right, no request for agen agenda address. We're now at that one discussion item for the evening, the forensic audit firm selection process update. Mayor Grimal and administration, you have the floor. Well, thank you, President McGinnis. I'm going to defer to Deputy Mayor Stevens since he is actually on the selection work group. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so, the as City Council knows and as the the audience knows who's been attending these meetings, the city put out a an RFP for a forensic audit. We received all of the responses to that uh, last week. The a, a subcommittee, a group of individuals from both the city council and the administration got together. We scored the um, respondents. There are two who came out at the top. The number one was Martian Minnick. The second was Barry Dunn. And so we will be working to put together a, a full scope of work and um, what's, what's the right one? a full scope of work and um, resolution re, not re, resolution but um, it, I have not had enough coffee today I, I should have had one more I should have one more pa, 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 check um, plan of action contract yeah. thank you a contract to to bring to city council in the form of a resolution to approve to enter into um an actual contract with with for the number one and then if not the number one the number two thank you others that wish to speak to this discussion item councilman nicholson uh, during this meeting it was nice to see you after we reviewed all of the information that every person at the table was unanimous on our first choice option it was a very clear uh, uh, option as the the firm that came in in the first place had a uh, breadth of experience CFPs CFAs uh, uh, a number of offices a great deal of experience in forensic audits especially with municipal governments but then specifically one thing that really interests me about this particular provider is that they also have a, uh, a financial crimes unit. Um, so if there was ever a time where during this forensic audit we unveil something that's really a hot item or something that the city should investigate further, uh, we have uh, a, a firm that is well suited to give us that advice and, and how to move forward. Um, whereas, you know, that is a very niche and unique thing um, that most audit firms don't have built inside. So it was a nice thing to see reasonable pricing, a wide variety of experience, but then also this unique piece that I think is really well suited for the scenario that we find ourselves in. Others that wish to have the floor? With that, that concludes that discussion. And thank you for the update. And uh, of course, we uh, anticipate that very shortly at our next council meeting that we'll be taking action um, and it's been thoroughly reviewed. Is there a motion uh, to Adopt the resolution recognizing March as Women's History Month. Make a motion. Support. Sorry. It's been moved by Councilman Rutherford, seconded by President Pro Tem Carrington. That motion before us. Uh, anyone wish to speak to it this evening? I do. Councilman Rutherford, you have the floor. As a woman who serves in this community, I think it's amazing that we honor the greatest thing God ever made, which is women. And so I'm so, so, so supportive. Thank you, Mr. Carrington, excuse me, Pro Tim Carrington, for bringing, you know, what is absolutely needed and necessary in this community that we honor the mothers, the daughters, the sisters, the aunts, the aunties, the grandmas, the great grandmas, who all are phenomenal women, phenomenal women. That's who we is. Thank you. Councilman Goodman. 
Yeah, yeah. I think they, they think this is just so important. Uh, oftentimes, when we talk about uh, the history of our country, what we talk about all the great men, that, that that's the standard conversation. And I think it's extremely important to not only realize um, just how integral to society uh, women are, but also the, the intersectionality of different identities. I mean, we recognize Women's History Month, but this is also for the women who uh, have been involved in helping out so many other people, whether they be uh, whether, they, whether they be women of color, people, uh, women who are poor, it, from all the different identities. I think it's an amazing idea to sit here and recognize um, not only just women in general as a whole for being, you know, set, again such an important part of our society, but truly recognizing like their uh, their contributions and essentially how much uh, of our society is again completely decided not only uh, by what the men do but by and if not furthermore by what the women do so I again extremely excited to see this others that wish to have the floor President Pro Tem Karen Tilk. Uh thank you President McGinnis um, I guess uh, as I went through uh, this particular resolution um, and what comes to mind is so many strong women in my own family. Um, in this past week, I lost uh, one of our matriarchs in my family, which is my aunt, who I spent many summers with uh, in a little place called Maryville, uh, Tennessee. And she's very strong and compassionate. Um, so it, when, it, when I think of our, our illustrious history, especially African American history and, and just history, period, uh, we have to give due uh, to our women of our community. Um, Many of us uh, know them. Uh, we may want to be like them because of, of their, their steadfastness uh, that they have in getting things done. And every man should want to raise a strong and a passionate woman. So, so as I wrote this resolution, I thought about every woman in this community as well as uh, internationally, of everything they brought to uh, the world, shaping our civil, cultural, social and edu educational experience here in Pontiac and abroad. So again, uh, women are phenomenal. Thank you. Anyone else wish to be recognized? Speakers list having been exhausted on adoption of the resolution recognizing March as Women's History Month. Roll call, Clerk Doyle. Nicholson? Yes. Parker? Yes. Rutherford? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Goodman? Yes. James? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Seven yeas, no nays. That motion carries. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution calling for community development block grant funding in-house administration? So moved. Support. Support. It's been moved by Councilman Goodman, seconded by President Pro Tem Carrington. And uh, that being before us, I uh, want to give the uh, administration uh, opportunity to elaborate further, and then we'll have council debate. Well, thank you, President McGinnis, and thank you, uh, Council, for uh, recognizing the importance and urgency of this. Uh, as the resolution recognizes, our administration has already begun work to uh, make this a reality. Uh, it's a high priority for us, as it is for you. Uh, and we've had conversations with the county already about it, including County Executive Dave Coulter. We've also had conversations with HUD itself, the, the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, and really uh, appreciate the City Council bringing this resolution forward to uh, underscore the urgency of doing this and the City Council's commitment to working with uh, our administration, the executive branch, to make this happen. Uh, I do want to give uh, Alex Barngesser, who handles grants uh, with our administration, an opportunity to speak a little bit about some of the work that's already gone in to uh, laying the groundwork to make this happen. Uh, so, uh, Ms. Borgesser, if you can uh, speak to that, that would be great. Sure. This is my favorite topic. This is what I spend almost all of my life working on. Um, for anyone who's ever been trapped in an elevator with me, um, I am so sorry, and you likely heard all about grants management. Um, let's see. Can I get this? Than last speaker. Um, as you know, uh, community development block grant funding uh, is administered by the county for a multitude of reasons. Um, and there's a long history there that I won't get into here, but I'm happy to have further conversation about. 
um, you know, this bringing CDBG as well as um, funding pursuit for both public and private granting is imperative to the city's success. And it's the reason why I work here. I was hired following the uh, award of a $100,000 grant from the Community Foundation of Southeast Michigan. And this funding was meant to provide resources to begin to build the operational infrastructure of a grants department here at um, City Hall. And thus far, we have successfully completed the deliverables of, of the, that grant award um, in ways that I'm really, really proud of. So I want to tell you a little bit about it. Our objective was to understand the current state of grants within City Hall, begin assessing the criteria and resources required for standing up a department, um, create grants management trainings, develop funding pursuit plans, create tiered implementation plans, um, developing proposed standard operating procedures, and preparing grant management tools. Um, receiving grants of, in, within the city's uh, walls is fantastic, uh, but the grant management and administration of those funds to be responsible financial stewards goes long beyond uh, the award point. So mm -hmm. we in, grant, in the grants world define that as pre and post award, and you'll hear me say that a little bit. We used a few assessment measures, uh, both kind of quantitative data, going through finances, getting an understanding of where grant opportunities might have come through City Hall previously. Um, as well as anecdotal interviews with staff, getting an understanding of how they partnered with out outside organizations to bring in funding to the city. We reviewed uh, internal documents or found where they might be needed or were missing, um, which was, uh, quite frankly, most of uh, our, our pursuit in finding these documents was to, to say that they just, quite frankly, did not exist. Um, we reviewed processes and procedures and created a current state assessment. Um, we've created a standard operating procedural manual, which is uh, just over 60 pages long, that displays workflows and what kind of staffing might be needed, what sort of um, operations and HR measures might be put in place to make sure that these dollars are managed appropriately. And that applies to both community development block grant, but also public funding, because grantors and foundations require the same type of, um, of regulation, slightly less stringent. We created nine training modules that walk you through the entire process of um, grant from the second that a notice of funding opportunity is awarded um, and all the way to a closeout of a grant. Um, uh, the implications of a grant award extend long beyond the closeout um, and, and the impacts that it has on the community uh, extend far beyond that. So, um, these training modules are important to bring staff up to date on how to manage these funds, how to stay within compliance so we can keep CDBG allocations in-house. We created a cost-benefit analysis. We established um, proposed salaries for staff that might be required to manage these funds. Um, it's wonderful to bring uh, this type of funding in-house, but then someone has to do the work. Um, and I don't just mean writing the grants, I mean the physical labor of executing the deliverables as outlined in the agreement for any sort of programming. Oops. We created a final report and recommendations, um, proposed ideas to, to sort of clean up and streamline workflows as it applies to grant-funded projects. That list is very long. Again, it is roughly 100 pages. This is a summary of, of those recommendations. And then we, lastly, we created a funding pursuit plan. So I worked with two sets of advisors. One was Baker Tilly. The other was uh, Philip Clay and Gabe Maitrab, who are former professors at MIT. Um, they helped me to identify funding opportunities. And this list is not exhaustive uh, that the city might be eligible for in pursuit of particular projects as outlined by the mayor and the council. At this time, that funding pursuit plan has an award ceiling, meaning the, the highest amount we could be awarded of $64 million. That is a tremendous amount of money for this calendar year. Um, granting is typically applied on a calendar year, not our fiscal year. Um, so you'll see that outlined here. We created a tiered implementation plan. Um, it would be unrealistic for us to say that we could implement all of these things at once. That's not possible. It's not healthy for an organization of this size. We said, what can we implement now? What can we do to grow? And how can we nurture that later? And we have it broken down into three stages. We have a grant project plan tracker, grant reporting trackers. We have um, a potential funding opportunity forms, grant closeout checklists, and the list goes on and on. We have built uh, the ship. We need to put gas in it to make it run. Next steps for us would include 
um, building out a budget, uh, acquiring staffing, uh, moving forward with training and implementation. Um, this grants department will be a self-sustained source of revenue for the city of Pontiac. Um, there are requirements from HUD and CDBG um, or through CDBG that would require us to have staffing before and many, many other things before we would be able to bring that administration back to City Hall. This is your classic chicken or egg conversation. Um, the county currently takes 20% administrative fee off the top of everything um, that we are awarded. Um, and just as an example, in program year 2019, the city paid the county essentially $299,000 to administer our programs. Um, they do it well. They do it within compliance. They, they work well with the city. Um, it is a tremendous service that they provide us. But there is no reason to outsource our core competency if it exists here within these walls. Um, we don't need to outsource this function. If we implement and employ the operational infrastructure that we have built, um, it is something that I'm very proud of and very excited for. Um, you know, planning and administrative costs are capped at 20%, and um, there's a similar metric for private grants, and you can also include administrative costs into those budgets as well. So like I said, this is really a um, self-sustaining department that can bring funding for um, our departments to provide our you know, both basic civics duty and, and civil services to our residents while also funding itself. Um, the initial startup costs for this department I can outline later, because I'm probably out of time, um, but we intend to uh, sort of fund ourselves for the startup costs by seeking private funding. Um, with that, I'll leave you uh, with this wonderful opportunity to um, review this resolution and consider um, supporting us bringing this administration back into uh, the city's walls. President Pro Tem Carrington and Councilman Nicholson. Well, I sincerely thank you for your presentation and I thank the administration for highlighting their plan of action when it comes to uh, this particular uh, program. Uh, I think, um, as you can see from a council perspective, that we definitely want to understand if, if do we have the organizational capacity to manage these type of grants. Uh, and I think as we go into budget sections, this would be, it's actually going to be one of the talks, is that do we have the organizational, organizational capacity to manage these grants uh, so basically everything you said tonight, we, we definitely want to make sure uh, that this city can, can, like you said, Oakland County has done a beautiful job, right? I had a chance to work with Oakland County for seven years in the school district because we had to outsource some of our departments to Oakland County. Um, so this is just a process uh, to, to make sure that we, we can also manage this grant and it's feasible for us to, to bring this back in-house. So again, I thank you and the administration for your work. Councilman Nicholson. The amount of work that you've put in is incredible. <laughs> I feel so much more comfortable knowing that we have such a robust plan um, that uh, it makes me sweat how much time and, and effort you've put into this, and it's it's really um, very impressive. Um, so thank you. Um, I think you know looking at these programs. I mean, especially working with HUD and in, in the pre and especially the post process is daunting and scary. Um, but knowing that we have this infrastructure and a, a, a plan that ha has a lot of roots um, and direction and it's phased and it's, it, it, to me, uh, I feel very comfortable um, knowing that this is in place and this infrastructure has been built. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I would uh, love to share some of those documents if you're interested in looking at them. Um, I'd be happy to print them and bring them over for you. Thank you. Others that wish to have the floor, Councilman Parker. Uh, just want to thank you for the marvelous work that you've done and the labor of love that you've put into this. It certainly is evident. But I, as we all understand, nobody can manage the money in your house like you can manage the money in your house. So thank you very much. <laughs> That's it. That's it. <laughs> Hearing no further discussion, want to uh, acknowledge President Pro Tem Carrington's work on this resolution as well. Thank you, sir. Hearing no motion to postpone and the speaker's list exhausted, uh, let's uh, proceed now to voting on the adoption of the resolution calling for community development block grant funding in-house administration. Parker? Yes. Rutherford? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Goodman? Yes. James? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Nicholson? Yes. 
Seven yeas, no nays. That motion carries. And uh, many more steps remain uh, to, to make that ultimately a reality, and we acknowledge uh, that it's a, it's a high order for uh, this council and the administration, a lot more steps to come, but uh, we stand firmly towards that ultimate goal. With that, we are now at a, an item that was postponed from last week. Uh, resolution to authorize the mayor to enter into a contract with Paymar Enterprises, Inc. for $1,622,250.70 for the Mill Street Reconstruction Project and authorize the mayor to enter into an agreement with the Oakland County Water Resources Commission to reimburse the city for the costs on the Mill Street Reconstruction Project associated with the improvements to OCWRC's water infrastructure. And so that was the motion that was made, so that's what's before us. Um, but we have the option to choose the alternate language and the alternate dollar amount, which is the roller method, and mm -hmm. or the method that seems to give it a longer shelf life um, that is a, a difference of approximately $29,000. Um, but I want to give the floor to the administration if there's any other updates you'd like on this item of business for the council's consideration. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it is our recommendation that we uh, go with the alternative method, the roller method. Um, and I'll allow Mr. Siddiqui to speak to the details around this, but we weren't able to find any <coughs> comprehensive studies that compared the two methods. However, as Mr. Siddiqui will explain, he was able to find some anecdotal um, evidence, some specific examples of roller method approaches that last substantially longer than the more traditional method. Uh, and it is our belief that uh, the additional $29,000 uh, is more than justified by the um, available evidence that the roller method likely adds some number of years uh, to the longevity of the roadway. Uh, this also will give us an opportunity to study the longevity of this particular roadway if council approves the roller method uh, so that we can do our own experiment, if you will, here in the city with whether or not and how long uh, the Mill Street uh, pavement uh, redo lasts with this alternative roller method. Uh, and uh, without further ado, I'll allow Mr. Siddiqui to get into the specifics of his findings and the specific examples that he's found that suggest the roller method does last much longer. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. So as the Mayor said, we did do some research. Um, there's There are no studies out there that compare the traditional concrete to RCC in like a direct, uh, you know, like a one-to-one -one study. Um, what is out there are case studies of uh, RCC that was uh, implemented previously. So mostly RCC is used in, uh, until now, mostly on industrial uses. So industrial yards, uh, rail yards, and, you know, uh, shipping yards and, and those sort of um, uh, applications. There have been some uses on roads as well. Georgia, in Georgia, they used them on uh, roadway shoulders, highway shoulders, um, or freeway shoulders, uh, as uh, in, in 2004. And until 2007, they didn't see hardly any deformation uh, on those. Uh, sorry, until uh, in 2017, uh, they hard, didn't see uh, any deformation on those uh, shoulders. So that's 13 years right there. Typically on a traditional concrete, you just you at least start seeing some some minor um, damage at that point. Uh, so our recommendation, I can't guarantee that, okay, if we do RCC, it's gonna last another two years or another five years or another 10 years. But I, I think I can uh, make the case that it would last longer than traditional concrete um, with less or or the same amount of maintenance. Is there a motion um, from this body to amend uh, the uh, motion before us to um, substitute the alternate bid dollar amount? I'll make the motion. Second. Did you want to be recognized? You want to make the motion? I want to make the motion. Okay, so Councilwoman James had her finger up first. Seconded by Goodman. But uh, my, my motion is on the uh, alternate bid. I want to make a motion that we accept the Mill Street Reconstruction Project's alternate bid for Paymar Industries in the amount of the 
$4.35. And, and sorry, I think both resolutions are actually in your packet. You We've already made the motion for the, the first oh, resolution sorry. last okay. week. So um, that's our motion to amend. We're essentially um, substituting and supplanting it with the alternate bid. Um, does that cover what we need to do, Clerk Doyle? So Yes. It's been seconded by Goodman earlier. So we have a, a motion to amend now. Um, since we'd already had that motion on the first, you know, sort of original bid, this is now supplanting it. Discussion on that motion to amend. Goodman? But all I want to say is, you know, thank you for coming to the, the last subcommittee meeting that's chaired by uh, Councilman James. Um, I think that you did lay out, you know, very well that um, when it comes to the, the different methods, we it, it's simply a... Uh, a best guess. We, we have some idea of how it will work and essentially at some point say a Pontiac needs to be somewhat on the cutting edge of something eventually to figure out how to better uh, meet the needs of our city. Mm -hmm. So I, I really appreciate once researching looking out for this method and then you know bring it to, to us as something that we can hopefully use to uh, improve our city vastly. So thank you for that. Thank you. President Pro Tem Carrington. Uh, yes. Also, I'd like to thank you for sending me the information that I asked for concerning um, these companies and their minority hiring practices. Yeah. Certainly, thank you. Um, of course, with these these companies, they had a very low threshold of a minorities working at these particular uh, contracting groups. Uh, I did have a chance to talk to the, to the mayor, uh, and, we def and he plans to work uh, moving, moving in the future, creating some kind of ordinance that's legal that we can use to increase our minority hiring with some of these contractors. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're Other discussion? Let's have the roll call vote on the amending action, and then we'll have the amended motion before us. Convoluted, but we already had a motion before us, so here we are. Roll call, Clerk Doyle. Rutherford? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Goodman? Yes. James? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Nicholson? Yes. Parker? Yes. Seven yeas, no nays. All right, that amended uh, action is done. We have the, the main motion as amended before us. So we have the alternate bid, Paymar Enterprises. This is Mill Street from Water to Huron in the downtown vicinity that does cross the, the emergency room bays of uh, McLaren Oakland Hospital that's been spoken to previously. And this council has chosen the ever so slightly higher uh, cost so that way we get it uh, ideally um, some substantially longer uh, shelf life on this road, and uh, we can assess that that's a, a method that bears fruit for other road construction. This is a full replacement. Is that a fair assessment? Road reconstruction, yes. Yes, so it's totally being reconstructed, and while they're at it, the Water Resources Commission, who's paying for part of it, will be working in the, the underbelly of the road while it's open. Correct. Any other discussion on this motion before us? Hearing no further discussion, roll call, Clerk Doyle. Carrington? Uh, yes. Goodman? Yes. James? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Nicholson? Yes. Parker? Yes. Rutherford? Yes. Seven yeas, no nays. That motion carries. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution to accept the Southeast Michigan Council of Governments, which is often known by the acronym of SEMCOG, planning assistance program grant in the amount of $36,000 for the Auburn Avenue traffic study and authorize the mayor to sign the SEMCOG agreement. I make the motion. Second. It's been moved by Councilman Rutherford, seconded by Councilman Goodman. Uh, that is before us. Uh, Auburn Avenue is wholly uh, contained in District 7. Well, not true. One side of the road for a few blocks is in one. That's it. Um, the side that has the worst potholes. That's on the. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, that's okay. true, but it's not District 1's fault. Uh, that uh, Auburn Avenue. Uh, definitely uh, needs love and attention uh, so that way we can take that important quarter in our community to the next level. And so on this front, Mayor Administration, on this item. Mr. Siddiqui, take it away. <laughs> All right. So previously we had received complaints um, from the previous council as well as residents about especially pedestrian safety on Auburn uh, as well as speeding concerns. Um, so we applied for safety funding, which we received, and we're working on designing that project currently, uh, which it includes upgrades to the signals, uh, reconfiguration of the Hill Street intersection uh, at Auburn, uh, and then 
uh, installation of some pedestrian signals like you have over there on, uh, on Telegraph. So like the, the flashing lights, as well as a Hawk signal, which is a pedestrian activated signal that's, it acts like a traffic signal when pedestrians pu push that button. Uh, and that one Hawk signal will be at the Family Dollar near Updike on, on Auburn. So, and then in 2025, we have funding to resurface the road. Uh, through federal aid, uh, uh, federal aid funds, uh, and so in preparation for both of these projects, there needs to be a traffic study uh, conducted to determine exactly where those uh, pedestrian signals need to be placed, what the timing of the signals needs to be, and and so on. Uh, and then part of that, we will also look at when we when we resurface uh, um, Auburn, do we change the lane? the laneage on Auburn, do we, do we go, instead of four lanes, do we go to three lanes or do we go to five lanes? Um, because right now, so if, if you're looking at a pedestrian crossing Auburn right now, they have to cross four lanes in one go, basically check both sides and cross. Uh, if you put in a center turn lane, you have a place where you can create a refuge for the pedestrian to stop and look the other way and then, then cross again. Um, and, and, and so, you know, in order to do that, you either have to go to a three-lane section or a five-lane section. And so that's something we will also be considering in this study. Uh, so the traffic study that has to happen regardless because of these projects that we secured, we then applied for a SEMCOG planning grant to reimburse us for the cost of that traffic study. So the uh, cost is, uh, the grant is for $36,000. Uh, actually, the total with the match is thirty-six thousand dollars. The city's match is six thousand five thirty-four, uh, and that will be coming out of the engineering services account in the major streets fund. Thank you. Discussion, Councilman Nicholson. The intersection at um, Woodward and Auburn, uh, you know, coming out of the Phoenix Center, has always been a hot topic with the left turn and it's not very clear about traffic not stopping. Is that part of this study? Will that, I know there was a, some talk about MDOT being Right, so that being, one being is in... primarily MDOT. Uh, so it's, it's, a shared, Woodward. it's a shared signal between MDOT and, and the city. Um, is this study something we could send to them to continue to urge them that this is a safety concern for both pedestrians and drivers? So we're already in talks with MDOT on that signal, um, but MDOT will be reconfiguring that signal as part of the Woodward Loop reconfiguration okay. project. Okay. Um, so we are already in talks. So you must notice that recently um, the e each bound has been separated now, um, east and west. So east has its own green light and West has its own green light mm -hmm. separately. So that sort of helps eliminate some of the left turn conflicts uh, that previously existed. Uh, it, it doesn't solve one of the other issues, but we're working with MDOT on that as well. Thank you. So. Councilman Parker and then Councilman James. Mr. Siddiqui, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as I, I think what you're doing on Auburn is very much needed, but I also have a concern that uh, with the traffic and are you, is your next project going to be Perry? particularly as it applies to making it more safer for the kids coming to and getting across the street to and from schools. Is that any time in your near prioritized list? So, you know, Perry is an MDOT road. Um, however, MDOT had already, at the previous city council's insistence, had already started a, an uh, initiative to look into uh, constructing uh, pedestrian refuges and, and so on. but. It sort of died down recently. I can, I can revive that with MDOT, yeah. Well, I think for the sake of our children crossing the street, we should right. revive that and get a quicker response from MDOT so that we can make sure that our children are safe. Absolutely. As well as the traffic that takes place on Auburn. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman James. You have the floor. Uh, yes, uh, the grant that's before us is a $36,000 study. Right. I want to clarify that the study is the study to make a decision about the 2025 funding for resurfacing? Uh, it, it actually impacts both the safety project that will be con under construction in summer of 23 um, because it will help us to determine the signal timings and the location of the ped lights 
uh, pedestrian lights. Um, so, you know, the traffic study includes traffic counts, uh, modeling of traffic flows, and, and, and all of that uh, sort of infra um, uh, data collection. Um, so it, it's, it's, it impacts both projects, not just the resurfacing project. It's, it's also impacting the safety project. Okay, well, my concern, though, is that, you know, the, the $36,000 project, the, the safety project, I understand, but if it's going to have an impact on the 2025 funding or, or uh, for the resurface, then uh, I feel that we need to have more community engagement. This particular uh, project does not call for community engagement, but the 2025 resurfacing, especially if you're going to be making decisions about whether or not you're going to go from four lanes to three lanes uh, to whatever, right. that requires community engagement. And, and, and the you're community absolutely... has to be involved in that decision. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. And we do, we will be holding after we're done with the, with the study, there will be a public engagement session as well to present our findings. Okay, your findings, but is that, does that give the community the ability to and collect feedback. Not men on exactly. Yes. Okay. Yes. Others who wish to have the floor. There's been a lot of concern, as you alluded to, over the years that uh, pedestrians, who especially those that live at Care Circle, Spring Lake, and they're seeking to cross Auburn, most mm -hmm. primarily to go to Family Dollar, but for other purposes, uh, it's a concern. So we want to know, you know, sort of take a full sense, and I'm grateful mm -hmm. that we have grant funding rather than it coming directly from uh, city dollars to have the data. So that way we can make strategic decisions with community feedback uh, moving forward. And I'm grateful that Auburn Avenue uh, is a priority as, because it's a very important corridor in our community that for years has not seen the investment uh, resources and support that it needs and deserves. Any further discussion? Hearing no further discussion on the resolution to accept the Southeast Michigan Council of Governments Planning Assistance Program grant in the amount of $36,000 for the Auburn Avenue traffic study and authorize the mayor to sign the SEMCOG agreement. Uh, roll call on adoption, Kirk Doyle. Goodman? Yes. James? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Nicholson? Yes. Parker? Yes. Rutherford? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Seven yeas, no nays. That motion carries. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution to approve a budget amendment for fiscal year 2021-22 to allocate a total of $100,000 for account 101-266-999.003 settlement payments for sick time payouts? I make the motion. Support. It's been moved by Councilman Rutherford, seconded by Councilman Nicholson. That is before us, Mayor and Administration, for context. Well, I think we spoke to these uh, a couple weeks ago now, and so I don't have much to add to any of these agenda items, which we've already spoken to. Uh, this agenda item uh, relates to making sure that uh, police and fire retirees from the city of Pontiac, and of course, while the city doesn't currently have its own police or fire departments, the city did have uh, its own police and fire departments. And the city, for some period of time, tried to contest whether or not uh, police and fire retirees were entitled to uh, payouts for their uh, sick and vacation time upon reaching the retirement age of 60 years old. Uh, that uh, litigation in the past was not successful. Our, our administration has not continued down that path of litigation, although there is one pending case still. Uh, but we want to make sure that we're doing the right thing by our police and fire retirees paying out the sick and vacation time that they're owed. Uh, that has been the nature of past uh, court rulings, and our recommendation is that we do this moving forward. And that begins by approving this budget amendment so that we can afford to do that uh, this fiscal year. And then in future fiscal years, we'll bring uh, that proposal as part of our annual budget request to budget for those expenditures to make sure that retirees from the police and fire departments in the past get paid out their sick and vacation time when they reach retirement age. Thank you. Councilwoman Rutherford. 
I just wanted to say I fully support this because I think it's great for us to be able to take care of the men and women who take care of us every day. So I just want to applaud the executive branch for bringing this for, uh, to the forefront. That's all. Councilman Nicholson. Mayor, the intention to keep a balance of 100000 from year to year will be a budget, will be seeking 100000 each year. Well, it depends on the year, is the short answer, and we're still trying to get a better handle on exactly what the current age of retirees is so that we can better budget moving forward. We believe that $100,000 is more than enough for this current fiscal year, uh, so we don't anticipate that that entire amount will be used for the remainder of this fiscal year, which of course ends June 30th. Uh, so there'll probably, we presume, be, be some significant amount of that left over that can roll over into the next fiscal year. Uh, but we hope to have a better handle on projected retirements uh, moving forward so that we can more accurately uh, budget. And that will, will begin with our budget proposal to Council in the next couple of months for the coming fiscal year starting July 1st. And there are no pending requests at this time or just this one case that's still? Um, there, there are, I believe, two or three. There, there's one pending request that we know of for sure. But I think there, there are two or three additional likely retirees that we believe uh, will uh, be paid out of this pot of money for this current fiscal year. Thank you. Any other discussion? Hearing no further discussion on uh, the uh, adoption of this resolution, uh, which is uh, approving a budget amendment allocating a total of $100,000 for settlement payments for sick time payouts. Roll call, Clerk Doyle. James? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Nicholson? Yes. Parker? Yes. Rutherford? Yes. Carrington? Yes. Goodman? Yes. 78, so nice. That motion carries. Is there a motion to approve, adopt the resolution to approve a budget amendment for fiscal year 2021-22 to transfer $72,000 from general fund balance GL account 101-000-309.000 to the general fund account 101-774-745.003 city events? It's been moved by Rutherford. Support. Seconded by Carrington. We have a motion before us. Uh, it's been discussed at a previous meeting uh, when we posted it, um, authorized the clerk to post it, uh, but Mayor Administration, context for the Council. Deputy Mayor. So um, as Council President said, this has been discussed at a previous Council meeting. These are budget amendments that are being made to um, cover expenses that the previous administration incurred that were not part of the budget. Specifically, these are expenses that dealt with special events. And uh, I would also like to add that approving this will mean that several small businesses in the city of Pontiac will be able to be paid for the services that they have rendered. Councilman Rutherford. I just appreciate that because we have several small business owners that have been waiting patiently to be paid. So I just appreciate you guys bringing this before us. Thank you. Councilman Goodman. I just want to add like, that there is an importance to doing this. I know that we don't enjoy having to clean up messes that we didn't create, um, but unfortunately we have to. And I, I know from experience and from hearing multiple different stories that you know, not getting paid for services for months on end can sometimes put an entire business out of business. Mm -hmm. So making sure that we are actually doing our due diligence as a city to make sure that these people uh, can get paid to keep their businesses open in the city and pay rent and bills is extremely important. So thank you for this. Others that wish to have the floor. At the risk of being harsh, I want to share that it is not lost on me uh, that the previous mayor who incurred these expenses uh, directly in opposition to the previous city council came to this body multiple times and even on that meeting where we were considering the posting of this particular budget amendment uh, chose uh, on, in the agenda address to not address the item that she most directly would have had the information, the rationale, perhaps to give us further context. You know, devil's advocate, I'm a very diplomatic person I'm going to hear many sides of the situation. I know in any scenario there's three sides to a story, uh, but it is not lost on me that for many weeks, the opportunity was there to share with us and the community what gives, and that opportunity passed by. So it's extremely uh, disappointing 
that we're in this position, um, but we are stewards of the taxpayer dollars, and we have a fiduciary responsibility to the taxpayers and to the full faith and credit of this city's financial reputation, because we ultimately will all pay the price if we just uh, bury our heads and um, pretend or wish it away. Any further discussion? So we now have the resolution to approve a budget amendment for fiscal the, uh, this current fiscal year, transferring 72000 from the general fund balance to the general fund account, specifically for city events. On that, hearing no further discussion, roll call, Clerk Doyle. McGinnis? Yes. Nicholson? Yes. Parker? Yes. Rutherford? Yes. Harrington? Yes. James? Yes. Six J's, no nays. That motion carries. Uh, is there a motion uh, to combine? Well, actually, um, is there a motion to approve, adopt resolution to approve a budget amendment for fiscal year 2021, transferring $308,000 from the general fund balance account 101-000-390.000 to the following attorney fees accounts? 101-266-804.000, legal services, $25,000. 101-266-804.018, legal services, Giammarco Mullins, $110,000. Uh, 101-266-804.021, uh, legal services prosecutions, Giammarco Mullins, $120,000. 101-266-804.022, Legal Services, Michigan Tax Tribunal, Giammarco Mullins, $45,000. 101-266-804.023, Legal Services, Code Enforcement, Giammarco Mullins, $8,000. I make the motion. Is there a second? Support. It's been moved by Councilman Rutherford, seconded by Councilman Nicholson. Uh, that motion is now before us. Uh, it's been discussed previously when we authorized the clerk to post. Uh, this particular budget amendment, uh, mayor administration, for any context. So uh, again, the context uh, from the last time that we were before you, the the legal services have been overexpended. Uh, again, one of the reasons that that was so is that you had the attorney attending every city council meeting. As you can see, we have um, stopped that practice. He is here for items where we believe that uh, his opinion may be required or, or requested by the city council, but that is just one example of how we have cut back on legal services so that we do not continue to overexpend. So this actually puts enough money into the legal services budget to not only bring us even with what has already been spent, but we have projected out to the end of this fiscal year to ask for enough money so that we will hopefully not need to come and make another budget amendment in this category. Councilman Nicholson. I, I you know, I love to um, point out um, situations that happened in the last administration. I, I do want to also balance that scale that there was a lot of uh, legal needs uh, that the city couldn't probably have assumed would be required um, during the last the, during 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 this last year, um, things like uh, retirement, uh, you know, issues with that that came up. And some of these were created. Some of them were created for us. Um, so I don't want to completely pin 100% of this overspending um, on personalities. Um, but you know, there will be future years, um, and maybe that name Giammarco will be the same. Maybe it will be different. Um, but uh, those services were, in some cases, absolutely required. In some cases, not at all. Um, so I just want to balance that scale a bit. Um, based on, uh, you never know what a year can throw you. Um, and, and this is, a, I think, a very difficult moving target um, because we have to respond to every lawsuit that comes our way. Um, so whether that name remains the same or changes, legal services will always be something that is really very difficult for a city to forecast. Thank you. Councilman Parker. Thank you. Uh, I'm certain that most of our community is, is certainly feeling at some level of disease even as we clean up this, this situation here. I know that uh, it is necessary so that we can rebalance the scale and get back to where we need to be. But at some point, I'm sure there's a lot of people who are saying, you know, some of that was just could have been avoided if we had just basically done the job that we were elected to do. Thank you. Others that wish to have the floor. 
speakers list exhausted. And the motion before us is this um, budget amendment for the current fiscal year is transferring $308,000 from the general fund to various uh, attorney fees accounts uh, and legal services accounts. Uh, no further discussion. Roll call on adoption. Clerk Doyle. Nicholson? Yes. Parker? Yes. Rutherford? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Goodman? Yes. James? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Seven yeas, no nays. Motion carries. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution to approve a budget amendment for fiscal year 2021-22 to transfer $182,000 from Youth Recreation Fund Balance GL account 208-000-390.000 to Youth Recreation Fund GL account 208-756-941.000? Services, building, and land rental. I make a motion. Second. It's been moved by Councilman Rutherford, seconded by Councilman Goodman. The motion before us, Mayor and Administration, for context. Thank you, uh, President McGinnis. Uh, like the previous uh, three, uh, excuse me, like the previous two uh, budget amendments, uh, this item is necessitated because the previous mayor uh, spent in excess of what the previous city council had budgeted for expenditures. In this case, uh, it was uh, spending $26,000 per month on renting a uh, location for youth recreation programs on Gulf Drive. Not only had the previous city council not budgeted that amount, but had actually voted to expressly prohibit those expenditures. One of our administration's uh, first uh, actions was to end uh, that uh, lease and those expenditures that had been not just not authorized, but outright prohibited by the previous council. Uh, I do have an update that I'll share under uh, my comments at the end of the meeting about the interim youth recreation and enrichment programs that we have put in place and that are starting uh, this, this week. So uh, I'll get into that uh, under my comments because it's not uh, directly uh, germane to this item, uh, but that's the background uh, relating to this budget amendment. I want to celebrate your use of the great vocabulary word germane. Uh, <laughs> any further discussion on this agenda item? Uh, no further uh, discussion. Uh, we now move to voting. This is the adoption of a resolution approving a budget amendment for this year transferring $182,000 from Youth Recreation Fund Balance to uh, the Services, Building, and Land Rental specific account for Youth Recreation Fund. Roll call on adoption, Clerk Doyle. Parker? Yep. Rutherford? Yes. Arrington? Yes. Goodman? Yes. James? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Nicholson? Yes. 78, no name. That motion carries. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution to authorize the city clerk to publish the notice of a proposed budget amendment for fiscal year 2021-22 to transfer $37,000 from general fund balance GL account 101-000-309.000 to the following general fund department 171 mayor GL account 101-171-702.000 salaries and wages $33,000 and 101-171-715.000 FICA city contribution, $2,000, and 101-171-716.000 medical insurance, $2,000. Make a motion. Is there a second? Second. Moved by Councilman Rutherford, seconded by Councilman Goodman. The motion is before us. For rationale, Mayor and Administration, you have the floor. Thank you, President McGinnis. Uh, this is a uh, notice of a proposed budget amendment, and uh, today's action simply will uh, publish notice publicly of a proposed budget amendment. It is not a vote on the budget amendment itself. Uh, but this is to publish a notice of a proposed budget amendment to fund two positions for the remainder of this fiscal year. Uh, approval of those positions themselves is a discussion item uh, that will come a little later uh, in the agenda, a couple uh, agenda items later. Uh, and this uh, budget amendment would fund those positions in the amount of the prorated amount remaining for this fiscal year through the end of June 30th. Any further discussion on this? As you alluded to, we'll, we'll get a little bit more into the, the context of the positions, but this just authorizes the clerk 
to publish the notice and keep the calendar moving forward um, for the budget amendment. Hearing no further discussion, roll call on adoption of this resolution, authorizing the city clerk to publish that notice. Clerk Doyle. Rutherford? Yes. Carrington? Uh, yes. Goodman? Yes. James? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Nicholson? Yes. Parker? Yes. Seven yeas, no nay. That motion carries. We're now at an item that was postponed from last week. It's the resolution, adoption of the resolution to approve the mayor's reappointments of Ashley Fegley, Christopher Northcross, Mona Parlov, and Lucy Payne, and the appointments of Renita Duval, Mike McGinnis, and Tim Shepard to the Pontiac Planning Commission. For additional context, Mayor and Administration, you have the floor. Thank you again, President McGinnis. Uh, as we discussed uh, last week, this is a resolution that would approve uh, my appointments to the Planning Commission. The previous mayor's uh, appointments had never been approved by the previous City Council, and so all of those terms had expired. Uh, I am proposing to reappoint four members of the Planning Commission and to appoint three new members of the Planning Commission. I, I welcome any questions or comments the Council has. Councilman Nicholson. I just want to um, point out that the mayor administration has sent us each a conflict of interest assigned by each member that is joining um, because I'm sure there will be some concern that there are uh, people that are joining the board that have some real estate interests within the city. Um, this is a very well written conflict of interest that uh, makes sure that none of that they all agree that they will have no financial benefit within the votes that they're taking. Uh, I think this is very commendable. Uh, it's similar to uh, conflict of interest policies that the, the council themselves has agreed to. Um, so I'm very comfortable uh, moving forward myself. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Rutherford. I'll be fully supporting this as well. If I concur with Mr. Nick, excuse me, Council, Council Nixon. Uh, what I appreciate the most is that they were so diligent and willing to sign this. It makes us comfortable. It gives the city of Pioneer comfortability knowing that there will be no oohs and ahs and no secret handshake means. So I appreciate it. Councilman Parker and then Mayor Grimer. Thank you. I just want to thank the mayor for being diligent and making sure that he tried to close up all the loops that may cause some issues within the community and as well as some issues on the, the planning council itself. I want to thank him for the, uh, for the, uh, what's that, I forgot what it was called, the, the conflict of interest policy and everybody that has signed that. And so I, I, I commend him for making sure it was airtight that as people move forward that they are doing what is best for the city and not for themselves. Mayor Grimal? Just to underscore uh, that, we take potential conflicts of interest very, very seriously. Uh, we are not playing around when it comes to conflicts of interest. I personally reviewed the conflict of interest form and in consultation with the city's attorney made some revisions to actually tighten up the conflict of interest policy and make it more strict. Uh, and while I won't uh, bore the audience by reading the entire conflict of interest policy and form, I will read the uh, operative language at the conclusion of it uh, under the section entitled violations of this conflict of interest policy. And that section reads any violations by a commission member of this conflict of interest policy, including but not limited to failures to disclose as determined by the city attorney, may result in recommended removal of the commission member and review for potential criminal prosecution. Uh, again, we take uh, these matters very, very seriously. Others that wish to have the floor. I want to celebrate the community members uh, who have served in the past. Two individuals who had been planning commissioners uh, are no longer uh, returning. I want to salute the public service of Dane Thomas, who had been the chair, as well as Hazel Cadd, that had served on the Planning Commission, and uh, that four commissioners are willing uh, to put in even more years of service is extremely commendable. This is not a compensated position, unless there's something I don't know, but right, this is voluntary uh, <laughs> position uh, to, and it's an extremely important uh, commission of this city. Uh, and I want to emphasize, we shared this last week, uh, but that the mayor, in, in sort of the language that creates these, these zoning entities, uh, excuse me, these planning entities for the for a municipality in Michigan, it says that the mayor or their designee, uh, basically an elected official, can serve. And for the last eight years, uh, the previous mayor was that, was that member of the planning commission. Before that, there was a, uh, the deputy mayor for four years had done it. But prior to the emergency manager, there had been a city council representative 
that sat on the Planning Commission in large part because many of these decisions ultimately will come here. And so that way the council can have a liaison through our subcommittee of economic development, housing and planning that can help engage with, with colleagues, but also then relate to the planning commission where the sense of the council is. And um, I, I asked the question multiple times to the mayor, are you sure you don't want that seat? And he was sure, uh, but I want to salute him and, and he feels that uh, the, the perspective of the administration will be well represented in this, the planning staff uh, that prepare the meetings, that make the recommendations. Uh, so I salute uh, that very proactive approach uh, that the administration has taken. Clerk Doyle, I want to highlight um, potential typographical items um, that wasn't, you didn't create this document, but I want to ask your perspective if I need to amend it. Um, one of the uh, new appointments, Tim Shepard, I believe his last name is spelled S-H-E-P-A-R-D, right? So there's, there's no H there. Um, so the agenda reflects it correctly, but I just wanted to make sure, do we need to amend it or, or can we consider that typographical and it's magic wand, it's, it's the accurate spelling? <laughs> Yeah, that's just a typographical. All right, here. the magic wand thereby being invoked. Um, any further discussion on the motion before us? Hearing uh, no further discussion, I want to point out that these are three-year terms. Mm -hmm. So since we're doing it the right way in a proactive way, this council will actually hear um, you know, appointments that will come in the future as well. And I will, of course, be in communication with my colleagues about how that's going. Uh, with that, no further discussion on the uh, adoption of the resolution to uh, approve the mayor's reappointments and appointments uh, to the Planning Commission. Roll call, Clerk Doyle. Goodman? Yes. James? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Nicholson? Yes. Parker? Yes. Rutherford? Yes. Carrington? Yes. Seven yeas, no nays. That motion carries. Congratulations to those uh, approved to the Planning Commission, and your meeting is tomorrow night. So have fun at the Planning Commission Wednesday, March 2nd, in these chambers, 6 o'clock p.m., open to the public. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution to approve two new positions for fiscal year 2021-22 within the Mayor's Office, Executive Office Coordinator, and an annual salary of $55,000, and Constituent Service Manager, and an annual salary of $45,000? I'll support Carrington. It's been moved by Councilman Rutherford, seconded by President Pro Tem Carrington. That motion now before us for background, Mayor Administration. Thank you. One of my uh, long-standing pet peeves uh, has been that when residents call City Hall or walk into City Hall, that it's very difficult for them to get a response or to be directed to whatever department they need to uh, go to in order to get their question answered or their problem solved or their concern listened to. And both of these positions are designed to alleviate that problem. Um, First and foremost, the, the constituent service manager, we may change that uh, title to resident service manager, but regardless of the, of the exact language used, the position is designed to make sure that there's somebody in charge of intake when it comes to citizen, resident calls, emails, concerns, questions, and complaints. Currently, there's nobody really charged with managing that process, with tracking those questions and those concerns, and making sure that they're resolved in a timely way. Uh, and this person would be in charge of receiving those calls, receiving those emails, responding immediately or close to immediately to those calls and emails, entering them in a database so that we can actually track what resident called or emailed, what is their contact information, what is their address, referring those questions, comments to, or concerns to the relevant department, and then making sure that they're being tracked, that that department is being followed up with to make sure that they're actually getting back to the resident with an answer, with a resolution of the concern or the problem. Um, this is really, critically important work to make sure that city hall, city government is properly serving our residents. And that constituent or resident service manager uh, is one of these two uh, positions. The other uh, position is executive office coordinator. 
Uh, that position will be uh, charged with a number of tasks, uh, but perhaps most importantly with helping to answer phones, making sure that people who come into the mayor's office are greeted, uh, but also, and I would say perhaps most, most importantly, uh, managing volunteers. We want to put in place a volunteer program so that there are volunteers in the lobby downstairs at City Hall so that when residents enter City Hall or when business people, for that matter, enter City Hall, there's somebody to greet them, there's somebody to ask why they're here, and ask how they can be of help. Uh, and those volunteers will be trained to make sure that when uh, visitors explain why they're here, that they're able to direct those visitors to the correct city department so that people don't have to wander around City Hall aimlessly or wonder what department they need to visit in order to have their problem solved, but they can be directed to the right department. And somebody needs to manage those volunteers, schedule those volunteers, uh, and make sure that the trains are running on time when it comes to properly servicing uh, our city's residents. So both of these uh, positions are really focused on better serving residents, better serving business people as they seek out City Hall either in person or by telephone or by email to make sure that their concerns, questions, and problems are being timely addressed. Thank you. Those who wish to have the floor? Uh, the mayor has uh, alluded to um, potential uh, flexibility on the, the title of the constituent services manager. Of course, uh, the, the title is not as crucial to the, the thrust of the charge that will be put to them, but Mayor, do you want us to amend the resolution to have a different title? Well, I'm, I'm open to that, absolutely. And, you know, the, the leading candidates are constituent uh, services manager or resident uh, services manager or perhaps citizen uh, services manager. Uh, I'm, I'm not overly concerned with the title, but I want to make sure that the title adequately expresses the role in a way that's, that's easily understood. So I, I welcome any, any amendments along those lines. Councilman Parker. Well, thank you, Mayor, and I, I certainly, I, if I may, I'd like to just add a uh, community service manager, since they're going to be operating in for the needs of the community. That is fine by me, absolutely. Thank you. Goodman, then Rutherford, then maybe Nicholson, I don't know. No, no, I, uh, I will agree with Pastor Parker on this one. Well, Councilman Pastor Parker. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I agree with the idea of the word community, I feel like it, it's, it's much more encompassing of what I think uh, the administration has in mind in terms of positions. So I, I think that's the way that we should go. What if, um, I'll, I'll spit it out and then Rutherford has the floor. What if it's um, community concerns manager? Because everything that the city hall does is a service. So essentially everything's services. But if we want to say it's, if this truly is what it's about, just sort of feeling the concerns and, and tracking them and, and, and seeing them to a resolution, does that accomplish the spirit of what the mayor's office would like? I am totally fine with that. I think all of these suggestions uh, are, are all in the same spirit and the same vein as making sure that we have a city hall and city government uh, that is promptly and appropriately addressing citizen uh, concerns, community concerns, and community uh, service management. So absolutely, whatever, whatever uh, the council is most comfortable with. Okay. Fine by us. I'll give the floor to Rutherford, then I'll make a motion to amend. I, I love your answer. I'm not here. Okay. Uh, is there? Okay. Uh, is there a motion to um, amend the first? Uh, therefore, be it resolved, uh, switching constituent services manager to community concerns manager. I make the motion. Is there a second? Support. It's been moved by Rutherford, seconded by Nicholson. So we have that amendment before us right now. Any discussion on the amendment? Hearing no discussion on the amendment, roll call, Clerk Doyle. McGinnis? Yes. Nicholson? Yes. Parker? Yes. Rutherford? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Goodman? Yes. James? Yes. Seven yeas, no nays. Uh, that amendment carries, that motion carries. Uh, so thank you for that very efficient workshopping of the, the new title. So we now have the main motion before us, the resolution as amended. Any other discussion? I, I just wanna celebrate the, the mayor and administration for making this a priority because it's something that 
we have heard from residents that we've experienced as residents. I imagine if you are at a city council meeting or watching the city council meeting, you too have had a concern that you felt might have got you know, lost in the abyss of city hall or whatever um, complaint database or et cetera. This is a, a recurring need and I anticipate that we will see pretty immediate returns both from the resident satisfaction from it, but also just tackling problems, which is also what we want to do. Councilman Nicholson. I, I just want to make a suggestion in the search for, for this individual, unless there's somebody already in mind. I think um, the intake aspect of social work is something that could be really um, helpful, and we have such a rich human service uh, agency um, uh, 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 Presence. <laughs> Presence in, in Pontiac, I think there would be a lot of great uh, candidates that have that experience, specifically because, one, intake is a huge piece of this and the management of that process and, and somebody having a good understanding of why that's so important and tracking that and getting back to people. I think a social worker would have a good mind, but also that people come to City Hall for things that we don't do. Um, and, and they may need to access those services of other human service agencies, other, other organizations within the city. So I think that could be a, 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 a good well to draw talent from. We are, of course, going to post this position and we will be looking for those kinds of relevant skill sets. Thank you. So on that note, upon adoption of this, City Hall's hiring. Yeah. <laughs> Any further discussion? With that, on the resolution approving the two new positions for this fiscal year within the mayor's office, roll call on adoption, Clerk Doyle. Ames? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Nicholson? Yes. Harker? Yes. Rutherford? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Goodman? Yes. Seven yeas, no nays. That motion carries. We are now at public, com public comments. Want to give the floor to President Pro Tem Carrington. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Mr. Quincy Stewart. Just before you start the clock on me, I just wanted to say for my employer, I don't work for the EAA. I actually work for Harper Woods School District. Just in case they see this, <laughs> I don't want, you know. I worked for the EAA a long time ago. All right. Tonight, I'd like to clarify some things for future reference so there are no misunderstandings. There, there are two places a council meeting to speak. One is agenda address, where specific items from the agenda can be discussed. The other is public comment. This section is protected by the First Amendment. To be sure, even in that case, threatening speech, defamation of character, or speech that incites violence against another does not fall under the purview of that protected speech. Other than that, pretty much anything else is protected. Even when the KKK speaks, the ACLU has even protected their right of freedom of speech, as difficult as that is to swallow. But let me get right to the point. Kenny and I have been speaking in these proceedings for over 25 years plus. Our right to free speech was challenged by the Moore administration. The case was taken to the Attorney General of the state of Michigan, and much of the administration's chagrin, the AG had upheld our right to free speech. Not only that, but the content of our speeches do not promote hate, violence, nor do they threaten anyone unless you interpret the truth we speak, factual data and factual history, factual analysis is threatening to one's sense of comfort in the status quo, unless one feels uh, threatened by two well-spoken, intelligent, well-researched and courageous new African men who refuse to kowtow, bootlick and buck dance to garner approval, status or favor from those who would rather see our obvious talents better utilized for the benefit of sustaining and promoting our own oppression. Public comment is the public square. If you have ever been to England, there are public squares where a multiplicity of opinions are expressed. City Council is Pontiac's boardroom, and those residents that live here, this is Pontiac's living room. We come here to see our city being, uh, being run, how our tax dollars are being spent, and to offer suggestions and opinions on a variety of subjects that might affect our lives. Make no mistake, Pontiac is a microcosm of the world that she sits in. A worldview, a national viewpoint, dovetails with any so-called city business that affects the world around us and affects us too. King was universally disliked when he was alive. Only when he was dead could, he, we, could we support his right to free speech. The same goes for Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey, Harriet Tubman, and a host of others. People can come here and pray, though there is no state religion in America. And it doesn't matter if an atheist or an agnostic likes it or not. You, you will protect their right to free speech and prayer. You will also protect my speech and Kenny's rights to, uh, in the same way, like it or not. Lastly, more than a few of us have expressed concern about the comment, public comment pushed to the back of the meeting. 
It forces those of us who wish to speak for wait to wait for hours, in some cases to speak for three minutes. Every fourth year in November, you ask, to, you ask us to put you first on a ballot, yet when you get in, you put us last on the agenda. This is not a question of you sending a message of you citizens won't tell us what to do. It's not a question of you changing this practice being interpreted as you lose, we win. It, this is an Iwo Jima, Nuremberg, or the Alamo. This is merely a request to reconsider that putting us last is extremely inconvenient for those of us who are either older or who work, but yet desire to have our voices heard here in this public square. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chuck Johnson. Sometimes it's pretty hard to come behind others who make comments up here, especially a person like Quincy. Sometimes I sit over there and I characterize in my mind uh, thoughts of how I would uh, say things at this microphone. Sometimes uh, I guess I could be a little bit over overboard or whatever. Sometimes I can be really nice. But you know what's really important is that citizens who come to these meetings, they come here for a couple of reasons uh, from my uh, observation. Uh, citizens like to get out of the house for an hour or two in the evening or half an hour just to come and spend some time away from home and this is a place that they can come and learn something from our government. Our mayor comes with a uh, very promising comments and very uh, uh, truthful comments in the same way with this commission. And uh, we, we, don't, we don't feel as though we should be last. Uh, we should also, uh, as, as, as a, a lot of folk have uh, alluded to, uh, we need to be at the top of the agenda so we can express ourselves, so we can have time to really negotiate things in our hearts and our minds so we can express it to each of you uh, so that you'll know exactly how we think and feel. But we sit here, we get bored. Some of the comments that are made are boring because folk don't understand uh, what's being talked about on the agenda. They want to come and they want to learn, but they don't want to sit here all night just to get to come to this mic and, and speak on a subject matter or whatever the case may be. I don't know how many of you up there agree with whoever made the rule to put us last on the agenda, I think that that should be revisited and reconsidered so that the citizens and the individuals who come to this meeting can be considered to be at the head of the agenda and not sit here hours on end to hear about things that a lot of us don't even understand. But at least it gives us the opportunity to see our government in action. We got a great government here. And a lot of folks sit at home and they want to say, well, hey, I need to go down and maybe shake my council person's hand. Or maybe I want to go down and just see how that person is uh, functioning in, in, in the seat, so on. There's, there's a lot of reasons why we need to be at the top of the agenda in some respect. With that said, thank you very much. Oh, thank you, sir. Mr. Kenny Anderson. Okay. Okay. Mr. Bill Massey. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. Pontiac and community at large and governance. As you know, Black History Month is closing as far as the newspapers and not all America say. I appreciate the help that I've received from the mayor's office and above all the citizens of Pontiac have been wonderful. And not in closing, but in one of the present, not the future. We had Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, and Barack Obama. He stood on their shoulders. He stood on their shoulders and made history. Secondly, if you go downstairs, not go downstairs, come into the building, you will see an exhibit that we put together. It's not I, we put together an exhibit with Martin Luther King's speech, the military from World War I all the way through to Afghanistan. I think it's wonderful. Had it been not been for the cooperation of the mayor's office, this could not have happened. We've tried for several years, but 
uh, this year is the top. Next year we'll have something different. Council and Mayor, thank you for the resolution of adopting Black History Month. Even though sometimes I get the feeling that some of you just said, well, A is here and is there. But the mayor gives me hope. <laughs> he he brightens me up. But the resolution said it all. Our heroes, we will never forget our heroes. The military, the Martin Luther Kings, and many, many others. We have over a thousand. Now, lastly, I want to thank my colleague. My good friend, Mr. Quincy Stewart, at one point in this month, citizens came to the podium with, I told you so, you ought to do, pointing the finger and blaming. Two weeks ago, this man stepped in and gave us a tremendous insight of how great we are and, and the people in Pontiac, citizens, and their contribution. Thank you very much, Mr. Stewart. When you walk out tonight, go downstairs and get another look. I think we'll be there two more days, I'm not sure, but I hope so. But again, thank you very much, Mr. and Mrs. Pontiac. Thank the families that brought their kids down today and asked questions and knew who Barack Obama was and knew who Martin Luther King was. They knew about his speech, rose apart, they knew everything. This is all about our heroes. And our heroes will last forever, not in the sand, but in the footprints of cement. Thank you again. Oh, uh, thank you, sir. Ms. Veronica Taylor. And that'll be our last uh, public comment. Happy birthday month, District 7, constituent Veronica Taylor. Thank you so much, Council. First of all, I want to thank God for life. I thank God every day for the life, even the pain that's going through my body. But I want you to understand, I have been watching this councilman from home. We give presidents 100 days to get things right. We give them all this time when they get in office. Right now, we gave our own president that I was proud to walk with, President Biden, 100 days. I'm asking Pontiac, I'm begging to you all to give this mayor and this council at least 200 days because they are deeply needed to clean up a bunch of stuff that y'all went and did. Y'all went and put a whole new council board up in here, but y'all want to come in here and tear them down. Give them a chance to do things that y'all have not had done. I'm asking you all to look at this. I have walked these streets for many days. I phone bank for the president of the United States daily. And I heard, that, heard the crowd party at saying that they won't change. They did what they need to do. And those that did not make it in those seats and didn't get to stay, you only have yourself to blame. Because the people of Pontiac have spoken. So to say that, I'm tired of hearing it. I'm tired of people calling my phone about it. Y'all need uh, 200 days to do what's right to clean this city up. And I'm expecting that Pontiac give us just that. Mayor Grimer is trying to do marvelous work here. From District 1 is trying, District 2, District 3, District 4, District 5, and 6. And I'm very much proud to say my own godson, even though I didn't support him. I'm going to tell the truth. I ain't supporting him because he didn't tell me he was running to the last minute. And you don't come to mama at the last minute. Now, to say that, I'm asking you all to work with us. And I want to thank you all. And listen, District 7 has a council have a meeting every 14th of the month. And I'm looking for District 7 to come out. And I'm also looking for my councilman, this in my district, that the councilman, and the mayor to clean up West Matter for me. Because it's an eyesore in our district where them seniors got burned out and that building has been standing. And they still have not gave those seniors what they need. And in the midst of saying that before I leave the podium, 
That's where I was on my way. I helped take care of those same seniors that got burned out. Y'all need to reach out because they was promised a lot of stuff from this last administration. So thank you and may God bless you. And thank you for wishing me a happy birthday. I'll be a beautiful 62. <laughs> uh, thank you, ma'am. That concludes our public comment, uh, President McGinnis. Thank you, President Pro Tem Carrington. We are now at closing comments. Mayor Tim Grimal, you have seven minutes. Thank you very much, uh, President McGinnis. Uh, I do want to thank Mr. Maxey and Thomas Lawrence and everyone else who uh, worked so hard to put together the amazing Black History Month display down in the lobby of City Hall. I do want to emphasize, however, that that was not made possible solely by my office, but rather uh, in conjunction with City Council uh, as well. And the great resolution uh, regarding Black History Month was put together by City Council, by President McGinnis, by President Pro Tem Carrington, and the other City Council members. And so it's important that uh, we acknowledge that city government's uh, recognition of Black History Month is not just about the mayor, but about uh, city council and the mayor working collaboratively. And uh, we're proud to be partners in this endeavor. Uh, secondly, and most importantly, uh, we're happy to announce that we do have our interim youth recreation and youth enrichment program up and operating. Uh, we have this happening on an interim basis through the end of this fiscal year, June 30th. Uh, and that's done in collaboration with United Wholesale Mortgage, where we have uh, Police Athletic League, PAL programs running in terms of sports, uh, but also in collaboration with our school district. We have established some programs at Harrington Elementary School. Uh, those programs include dance, art exploration, the Girl Scouts, uh, and after-school tutoring programs. We may be adding some offerings, but those are the initial four offerings that we're offering at Harrington Elementary School. If you're interested in signing up for those offerings, you can go to the city's website and uh, go to um, departments, and then under departments, go to community centers. Uh, under community centers, uh, go to youth recreation center, and then go to uh, log in to the rec desk and then go to programs under that. And you can uh, identify the timing of those programs, the dates and times that they're offered. Again, those are being offered at Harrington Elementary School in partnership and collaboration with the school district. And it's really important if we want youth recreation and youth enrichment programs to be successful, that we do that in a collaborative approach with other community partners. And so as we uh, put together the work group to look at a permanent long-term youth recreation and youth enrichment program starting with the new fiscal year on July 1st. Uh, I can tell you that that is very likely to be done in collaboration with other community partners. Uh, in addition, uh, we have made a decision on appointing the Medical Marijuana Commission so that we can hopefully bring that chapter uh, to a final conclusion uh, here in the city. I know that there may be consideration given to uh, ultimately moving in the direction of adult use or recreational marijuana, uh, but the final uh, piece to the medical marijuana component is establishing the Medical Marijuana Commission so that all of the administrative appeals can be heard and receive final disposition. Uh, we have put together a conflict of interest uh, form that is uh, virtually identical to the conflict of interest form for the Planning Commission. Uh, and uh, pending their signing that form, uh, we will be appointing the following four individuals to the Medical Marijuana Commission. Those individuals in, in alphabetical order are uh, former uh, Sheriff's Department Lieutenant Robert Ford, Chuck Johnson, Yana Shepard, and Scott Mays Turner. Uh, and again, as soon as those individuals sign their conflict of interest forms, those appointments to the Medical Marijuana Commission will be finalized. Um, lastly, uh, we have a couple of town hall uh, meetings coming up. Uh, on March 7th at 5.30 p.m. here at City Hall, we will have a town hall forum about where to locate the skate park project. We've talked about the skate park project at past city council meetings. It's very important that we pick uh, the best possible site in the city for 
that skate park. And so we welcome all members of the public to join us this coming Monday, March 7th at 5.30 p.m. right here at City Hall for that discussion. Uh, the following, uh, well, actually a couple weeks uh, after that, we've got, uh, or the following week, I should say, after that, we have a, a couple of town hall forums regarding uh, the Clinton River Trail. Currently, the Clinton River Trail runs from the west boundary of the city and dead ends at Bagley Street. It picks up again at the far eastern boundary of the city, Updike, uh, in Auburn Hills. Uh, but it's important that we have a meaningful connector uh, between those two segments of the Clinton River Trail. And we have a couple of town halls planned on March 16th. Uh, one at 11 a.m. in the morning, the other at 6 p.m again here at City Hall uh, to talk about what route that connector should take uh, and also what amenities and how that layout uh, should be designed along that route. And although I said that was my final item, I, I do want to mention one other item that uh, came up at a past City Council meeting, and that is finally removing the tatters, the remaining tatters of the Phoenix Center canopy. Uh, we have, uh, after going through the process with the insurance company, which was the first step. We have now prepared a purchase order uh, for Lee contracting to take down those remaining tatters, and that should be accomplished within the next week or two. Uh, and uh, that concludes my report, Mr. President. Thank you. Now, Clerk Doyle, you have the floor. No comments, Mr. President. All right, we turn to city council members. District 1, Melanie Rutherford. Good evening. A couple of announcements. March the 5th is the CDC meeting, which will be online at 1 p.m. Um, you can get the Zoom information from Mr. Robert Bass. April the 9th, there will be the first, um, excuse me one moment, Bloomfield Hills estates i mean bloomfield hills at 1 p.m and i'm waiting i have to get quest with from uh, mr stewart i didn't have any information march the 12th will be the coffee and conversation that i'm hosting which will be at the alley cat it is for district one members but all the community members are welcome i also want to talk about the great exhibit that i went to at the pontiac creative arts center it was amazing um a local art, a artist displayed her artistry um about relationships in a sense uh, it's a great great exhibit you should go visit it um lastly i want to pray for the families in district one especially for those who are sick and shut in and to that i say good night thank you district two's councilman brent nicholson good evening thank you to the mayor and administration for another week of transparency and responsiveness uh district two's community advisory meeting is the fourth monday of every month that's coming up uh, march 28th 6 p.m. at the Golden Walsh Nursery. Uh, we have, and thank you to Coleman Yoakum and Dustin McClellan, the co-chairs of that advisory group. They do a fantastic job in bringing us uh, a different speaker and a different uh, topic to, 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 to consider each uh, and every month. The Finance and Personnel Committee meeting uh, is the second Thursday of every month in the Legislative Conference Room uh, at 2 p.m. Uh, you're welcome to attend that. Uh, Earth Day street signups are still up on my council page next door and Facebook. Please consider adopting a street in District 2. Um, we have some uh, that are great, but we're still looking for a lot of our neighborhood streets. Um, so if you live or don't live in District 2 and are passionate about cleanup, um, as a citywide effort, District 2 is taking a strong uh, interest in making sure that every single street is adopted. Community projects, um, the, uh, the uh, idea phase has now concluded um, for District 2. Uh, there were over 25 responses. Many of those responses had maybe 10 to 12 ideas. Um, so we have a lot to consider that um, feasibility group, um, those that thank you to those that have signed up, will um, uh, be meeting in the next uh, two weeks to uh, look those over and prioritize um, some of those ideas so we can best use those funds. Um, I wanted to uh, say it was fantastic to attend the first ever uh, Micah 6 uh, gala um, that was this past, week, past weekend at the Australian Theater. I'm very excited uh, to support the uh, restoration and reimagination of uh, what the Webster School. Um, the amount of community uh, programs that are going to be located in the school and the restoration that they're undertaking is unbelievable. Um, and to go to that gala and see the support in and outside of our community to make this happen is uh, remarkable. 
school. I also wanted to say thank you to District 2 residents Scott Stewart, Coleman Yoakum, and Dustin McClellan for their efforts to begin a county chartered Main Street group. This will be, the be, Pontiac will be the only community that has two Main Street groups. Um, this county chartered group um, is a part of a, a, a national program called Main Street um, that will allow them to receive grant dollars, um, to foster a lot of collaboration along the Huron Street corridor um, so that one of those very busy uh, corridors that are in our city will receive a lot of love uh, and a lot more collaboration um, and some, some really great resources in the future. It's, it's a huge undertaking. Uh, thank you to those that are involved. And I, I want to express if anyone has a business or knows of a business owner in the Huron Street corridor, please have them reach out to Scott Stewart, Coleman Yoakum, or Dustin McClellan um, to get involved uh, because it's going to be an invaluable opportunity. Thank you. District 3's Councilman Mikhail Goodman. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Going to try to keep this short. Uh, first of all, thank you to everyone who gave me birthday wishes over the past week. Uh, birthday was Friday. Um, so now I am no longer the 21 year old council person. I am now the 22 year old council person. Uh, it doesn't sound as cool, but I'll take it. Um, Unfortunately, at the the, the uh, District 3 meeting, uh, no residents showed up, unfortunately, um, which was held over Zoom. So hopefully, the, uh, this, the one coming up, this month, coming up this month, which I will put the date out soon, uh, we get some more community uh, feedback and get some involvement. Um, and then lastly, I just want to touch on the fact of, uh, I had an amazing time this weekend actually going to the uh, Blackout Expo that was at Divine 26. Um, that was uh, hosted by the Black Women's Roundtable. Um, being able to come in and just, you know, see all the different local businesses, especially owned by our residents, uh, from all the uh, different sectors, whether it be uh, food, uh, clothing, uh, skincare, all those amazing things. It's, it's nice to be able to do all that uh, in a very positive space in our community where all these people can get uh, the chance to interact and kind of do all these things in one place and have that community. Um, so I would say, you know, be mindful uh, of other times that, that this happens, uh, a way to support uh, small businesses, especially ones that are owned by Pontiac residents um, that come about like this. So I would say, you know, definitely keep an eye out and patronize those businesses in your city who, you know, do this work. Um, but outside of that, please have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you. District 4's council person, Councilwoman Kathleen James, your closing comment. Good evening, uh, council, uh, audience, and those uh, that are listening. I've got a few comments. Uh, first of all, we held our District 4 Community Council meeting last Thursday on uh, February the 24th, I believe. It was a great meeting. Uh, we are doing it online via Zoom, and we didn't have a, a, a large number of participants, but the ones who were, were on were very engaging. We came up with some great ideas uh, for things that we wanted to do for the citywide cleanup, which is March the week or the, the week of April 22nd. That whole week is going to be uh, cleanup activities going on throughout the city. And I hope that everyone, uh, all of our residents will try to get involved. There are going to be a ton of opportunities for you to do some cleanups around your house, around your property, and we really hope that everyone gets involved in it. Uh, I Also, uh, the comments that the mayor made in terms of the youth recreation, uh, I was glad to hear those, and I am looking forward to working with the mayor, with Deputy Mayor, uh, in terms of making some of those uh, public partner, uh, private partnerships, the that you mentioned because we do want to see some engagement some recreational activities happening within district four and we know to make that happen we're going to have to get various groups in the city uh, hopefully we can get some programs going in our parks one of the ideas that came out of our of our council meeting was reading in the park trying to develop some kind of a reading program for uh uh J.C. Park as well as uh, Hawthorne Park. So there were some great ideas that came out of it that we can partner with other groups in the city to make these kind of things happening. But bottom, bottom line is we have to bring play and engagement and recreation to our kids. It has to be 
closer within the neighborhood. You know, we've got some facilities now, but we also need to get some things uh, designed so that kids can have structured, uh, supervised play within their neighborhoods for, you know, when they're out of school for the summer. So that's my goal uh, for District 4 is to plan and to organize ways that we can create opportunities for our families, to, for their kids to have <clears throat> things to do in, the, in their neighborhoods for this summer. So that's all. Thank you. District 5's council person, council person William Parker Jr. Thank you, Mr. President. Good afternoon, District 5 and Pontiac City residents. I want to start out by thanking the mayor and the deputy mayor for their spirit of availability and their spirit of teamwork, partnership, and collaboration and figuring out how to fix those things which are wrong in this city. Certainly, it didn't happen in one day and it won't be fixed in one day, but they have a spirit of collaboration, teamwork, and availability to at least come up and sit down with you and talk about a plan of resolution. And for that, I say thanks. The CDC District 5 meeting will be March 10th, 6 p.m., down in the Lions Den meeting room. I pray that each and every one of you who are concerned about what's going on in District 5 will show yourself at that meeting. There's some things that we need to talk about as we get to that meeting. I'm reminded that Dr. King said that the time is always right to do what is right. And most of you have heard some of the things that was done this evening, and I know a lot of us had a spirit of unease as it was taking place. I know I did. But the time is always right to do that, what is right. And so this council and this administration has been trying to right the ship that we know was leaning and almost full of water when we took office. And for that, I said thank you. And to do that, it's going to take partnership, collaboration, and teamwork. I want to thank our Council President for instituting a moment of silence that we remember those whom we have lost during this pandemic. Well, we know a lot of us have lost loved ones during this pandemic, and it does at least let us know that uh, we are there with you. We may not have been there physically, but we are certainly thanking you and, pray, and praying with you as you go through your season mm -hmm. of loss. Finally, I want to say to the, to the Council that the law and courts meeting did not take place uh, this Monday. We meet every fourth Monday of the month. The community certainly is invited to come out and share with us, but we did not meet this Monday because there was nothing to discuss about. And so, again, uh, as, I, as most of us ran on that, that issue of partnership, teamwork, and accountability, there's a lot of people who know what's wrong with this city, but they won't come to the meetings to discuss what's wrong with this city. If you want to get it fixed, show your face. Let's talk about it. Let's put a plan in place. And let's see if we can get some of the issues resolved. All of them won't be resolved in one day, but I guarantee you we have an administration and a council that is certainly working diligently day and night to resolve the issues of this city. And for that, I said thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you, sir. District 6 Representative, President Pro Tem, William A. Carrington. Good evening, everyone. And first and foremost, I have to thank everyone that came out tonight, uh, also to my colleagues. I commend each and every one of you on this weekend. You guys was out and, and showing yourselves in the city and supporting many events. So I sincerely thank you as I saw you out. Um, this month is uh, Women's uh, History Month. So please continue to celebrate the women in our community. Um, without, their, without them being a the backbone of any community, communities cannot survive. So again, continue to celebrate our women this month. The Pontiac High School wrestling team. Uh, as everybody know, I'm a, I, I love sports and I love supporting our young men. Um, not only in the classroom, but when they go out and compete and represent the city of Pontiac with such pride. Uh, this weekend, Pontiac High is sending three uh, wrestlers to the state finals. And if anybody loves wrestling, you know that the city of Pontiac has a strong wrestling history. A lot of state champions have come through the city. So again, in that spirit, these three young men, um, uh, Tavion Etchen, Julius Polk, and Adam Polk, will be competing in the spirit of those that they come at, that they stand on the shoulders of all those other champions uh, this weekend for a Michigan High School State Finals Championship. Uh, 
Also, uh, to someone that I've been knowing for 12 years, I consider him a friend in the 6th District, uh, Mr. Dane Thomas. I'd like to sincerely thank him for his service to the city uh, and sitting on the Planning Commission and also for chairing GM Housing uh, Neighborhood Association um, uh, meetings for all these years. Um, just, I like to keep, I don't want to share his, his, his personal story, but I also like this community, the team, to keep him in his prayers. Um, he's been a great, great person to work with in the 6th District over the years. Um, and we have definitely partnered, partnered in uh, making sure that our community in the 6th District is clean and well kept, and the parks are, are well taken care of over the years. So please keep Mr. Dane Thomas in your prayers. Also to all those that called me last week and say, you're not at your meeting. Well, everybody knows I don't usually miss meetings. In seven years on the school, school district, I probably missed two in seven years. So I really take uh, serving this uh, community. Uh, but last year I lost uh, uh, one of my matriarchs, someone I was very close to, my aunt, um, Chula May. Um, and, and I certainly thank the community for the calls I received as well as the council uh, for also calling me and thank you for the card and I'll make sure I give it to my family. So I appreciate you uh, for your concerns and good night. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm Mike McGinnis, District 7's representative. Hello. Uh, Want to make sure the community is aware the Planning Commission uh, meets uh, that first Wednesday of the month. And so that's this Wednesday, March 2nd, 6 p.m. here at the uh, City Hall. Our subcommittee, um, the one that I chair, Economic Development, Housing and Planning Subcommittee, the next meeting is this coming Monday, March 7th, from 9 to 10 a.m. in the Council's uh, conference room. Uh, and for District 7, our East Side community meetings, uh, as was shared uh, this evening, uh, our upcoming one is Monday, March 14th, 7 o'clock p.m. at Prospect Missionary Baptist Church, which is at 351 Prospect in Pontiac District 7. So that's the 2nd, the 7th, and the 14th um, important meeting dates um, that sort of I'm a liaison for the council for us. There you go. Uh, also happening the same night as the city council meeting, Oakland County Executive Dave Coulter is giving his state of the county address, and he very intentionally is doing it in Pontiac again. It'll be at M1 Concourse on Tuesday, March 15th. That is also a council meeting. Uh, the county executive reached out uh, to the council and to me, as well as to the mayor, to let us know that it, he worked very hard to try and not have that scheduled conflict, but he's traveling internationally, and there's some religious holidays as well that uh, was limited his options, but he wanted to show, make sure we knew there was no disrespect. Um, that is scheduled to start at 7 p.m., and obviously our meetings start at 6 p.m. I'll work to not schedule special presentations or other sort of time intensive parts on the agenda so that way we can be very efficient and then make our way down Woodward to even if we can't get to all of the speech, uh, there is the reception that follows afterwards. So that way uh, you won't necessarily be held hostage here at City Hall. But even if, if city business gets too long and we aren't able to make it, uh, the county executive agreed to our invitation that he will come here personally uh, to give the highlights that specifically address Pontiac opportunities on uh, Tuesday, March 29th, if I've got the date right. But so um, we'll re reiterate that announcement as we get closer, but the county, Oakland County Executive Dave Coulter will be making a spe special presentation just for the Pontiac City Council and the community's benefit uh, at the end of this month as well. So for the sake of time, I'll conclude with, I did a tour of United Wholesale Mortgage, a very large complex that's located in Pontiac District 7. They have 2 million square feet at UWM. That's big. And they have over 8,500 employees, and over 1,000 of them are Pontiac residents, they shared with me, which I was very impressed to see. Mm -hmm. And as walking through their facilities, it's a very youthful um, mm -hmm. workforce and very racially diverse uh, workforce. But uh, Pontiac is being able to capitalize on those job opportunities, mm -hmm. but there still are more. But I also wanted to just finally share that there are vendor opportunities for Pontiac residents, for their employees, but also restaurants that do guest restaurants in their cafeteria where a Pontiac re uh, restaurant can get that opportunity. So for the sake of time, I'll leave it at that. More opportunities and announcements to come. Is there a motion to adjourn this evening's meeting? Support, Carrington. It's been moved by Rutherford, seconded by Carrington. Hearing no discussion, 
Roll call on adjournment. Clerk Doyle. Nicholson. Yes. Harper. Yes. Rutherford. Yes. Carrington. Yes. Goodman. Yes. James. Yes. McGinnis. Yes. That motion carries. We stand adjourned at 8.28 p.m. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing nobody has a hit.